Hey everybody, Peter Mancuso here from a little show called Now That's What I Call a Franchise. Maybe you've heard of it. Before getting into this week's episode, um, I just wanted to talk about some stuff going on. Um, we record our episodes you know, months in advance, but as of the release of this episode, uh, both the Writers Guild of America and the Screen Actors Guild uh, have gone on strike against basically all of mainstream Hollywood, uh, which is represented by the Alliance of Motion Picture and Television Producers. Basically, both unions are demanding their fair share of the profits that their hard work and uh, dedication produces for these, you know, multinational media conglomerates and uh, their overpaid CEOs. Now, when SAG went on strike, there were some questions around what counted as promotion, uh, something that could be considered crossing the picket line. Um, and there's been a lot of confusion and misinformation and mixed signals about this, uh, particularly for non-union members, um, even just covering older films released by these struck companies. And on our show, that's all we do, right? We've covered like three franchises owned by Disney, which I think speaks volumes about the state of the industry. Um, and now we're focusing on Batman, which of course is owned by Warner Brothers. So what do we do? Well, after sifting through all the information the best we could, we've decided to continue our release schedule as planned. Uh, we're not doing this out of laziness. Uh, if anything, delaying our schedule would actually give us more time that we desperately need uh, to watch these films and record our thoughts. But by releasing our episodes as planned, uh, we at least have the chance to insert this intro uh, and make it clear in no uncertain terms, Viviana and I and the New Arts Workshop stand with workers above and below the line, striking or not, unionized or not. And we're not going to remove this intro from our episodes until the studios satisfy the union's demands. If you want to help the cause, post about it on social media or donate to each union's respective strike funds. Alone, we can't do anything. Together, we can change everything. All right, I'm getting off my soapbox now. Time for the show. You're listening to the New Artist Workshop. Metal Batman! Huh? You're grown, it's all metal, it's full of holes, you know? Holy! Oh. Welcome back to your favorite podcast. Now, that's what I call a franchise. I'm Peter Mancuso. And I'm Viviana Metzger. And this and bleh, have my this one. Uh, and I'm Viviana Metzger. <laughs> and I'm Viviana Metzger. And this is the show where Peter and I pick a film franchise and go through every single installment, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And to be clear, we're defining a franchise as a series of films with at least four entries. So, Viviana, what are we talking about today? Okay, so today we are talking about the 1995 film Batman Forever. Forever. No colon. No colon. Uh, and this is, of course, your one and only spoiler warning. So if you haven't watched the movie, go do that before listening to this episode. It is available on Max. As, as are most of these. Yeah, most of them. Um, <laughs> okay, Viviana, I think we've given you... It's been a while since we've done an episode. So... I forgot how to do it. No, yeah, just kidding. So <laughs> I forgot I heard that. I believe we've bequeathed it the letterbox my... blurb to you. Bequeathed. So. Bequeathed. Yeah, this is, this is a long one. Okay. Okay. Well, a lot of stuff happened to this movie. Oh, Oh, sorry. Shut up. Okay, so here is the letter blocks. Bl letter. <laughs> <laughs> God damn it! Here is the letter boxed blurb. The Dark Knight of Gotham City confronts a dastardly duo, Two Face and the Riddler. Formerly District Attorney Harvey Dent, Two Face believes Batman caused the courtroom incident, which left him disfigured on one side, and Edward Nigma computer genius and former employee of millionaire Bruce Wayne is out to get the philanthropist as the Riddler. Former circus acrobat Dick Grayson, his family killed by Two-Face, becomes Wayne's ward and Batman's new partner, Robin. Those were very weird structured well, sentences. Well, I was like reading it. structured sentences. All of those are technically grammatically correct, but they're just like, they just feel They're wrong. Like, <laughs> former circus acrobat Dick Grayson 
his family killed by Two Face. <laughs> I believe that should be whose family killed by Two Face. There's a lot of sentence fragments going on. There are on a lot here. of sentence fragments. And and misplaced semicolons. It's just it's all over the place. Um, but it is quite long, but I think it is indicative of the film that there's I feel like there is <laughs> it is a little overstuffed. It's a it's it's kinda we were talking about this before, so one of the there trivia things lot, I found is, stuff going on. is I feel like there's like a lot of qualifiers on this trivia, so it's like not even worth mentioning, but just for the purpose of this point I'm making. <laughs> it is the shortest live action Warner Brothers Batman film. So just counting the Adam West one, which is 20th Century Fox. Mm-hmm. But it doesn't feel like the shorts. It comes in about two hours and one minute. Um, <laughs> but it feels very full. And I don't mean that in a bad way where it's like it felt longer than it really was because it dragged. Nor do I mean it in a good way where it's like like how we talked about with Mask of the Phantasm where that's only like 70 minutes. But yes, it feels very yes, like yes. full and complete. Yeah. It's kind of both of those things. It's both for better and for worse. Um, yeah. But why don't I talk about um, some basic info? Let's do here. it. We need okay. basic info. We need you. How can you talk about the complex info if you don't have the basic info? Exactly. So, so it was directed. So, uh, it was directed by Joel Schumacher, who uh, is not Tim Burton. No. Right, so we'll talk about it. Tim Burton did not direct this. He's one. not. <laughs> um, he wrote the Wiz. Ooh, the not Wiz. not the music. I presume like the dialogue in the movie, like or not the the, the like the, the, the lines. Part? Yeah, like the line. Well, oh. no, because I think it was a play first. A music, it was a musical, stage musical first, uh-huh. which had like scenes, and I believe it was what's called a book musical. Oh, it's based off the Wizard of Oz, right? So it's well, like, yeah, adapted. Yeah, so yeah. Like- a, a book musical doesn't mean like a musical based off of a book. It just means a musical that uh, has a book, meaning like a script, like there's dialogue, as opposed to something uh, okay, like okay. Les Mis, which is like basically an opera, yes, like a song yes, yes, right? Yes, 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 yes. Um, so I, I imagine making the Wiz movie, which is directed by um, Sidney Lumet. Mm-hmm. Of all people, who's like one of my favorite directors, who did like Dog Day <laughs> Afternoon. Um, oh, he did. That's so he weird. He did Network. Oh. It was like just some random studio movie That's he weird. did. My point being is that I'm sure they just took like the script from the stage version. Yeah. But I guess Joel Schumacher must have done some additional dialogue or whatever. He, I don't think he did any music whatsoever. Mm-hmm. Um, but he also directed Saint Elmo's Fire, mm-hmm. uh, The Lost Boys, and Flatliners, which were like fairly popular movies in the 80s. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, the film, this film, however, was written by Lee Bachelor, Janet Scott Bachelor, I believe they're uh, oh. a couple, and Akiva Lovers. Goldsman. Um, gold, g- gold, Goldsman or Goldman? <laughs> I don't. This I, is your job. No, wait, hold on. Goldsman, I think. Goldsman. Yeah. Um, he he wrote several films directed by Schumacher. Is Akiva? That's. Yeah, that's his name. Okay. That is his name. That's his that's the name. name? Yes, it is a him. Yes. Um, it was produced by Tim Burton and Peter McGregor Scott. Um, McGregor Scott co-produced The Fugitive, which was like a okay. popular action movie with Harrison Ford, I believe. Mm-hmm. Um, like I said, Tim Burton produced this. But I don't know how much of his involvement. It may have been this kind of like name only. Which Yeah, I thought it was interesting because he's like continued with it, even if it's just a name only, you know, yeah. but it's like something you wouldn't really like attri- like, who thinks of Batman when you think of Tim Burton, you know? Like, yeah. it's usually, like, Nightmare Before Christmas. Like, all the claymation stuff, you know? Well, it's funny when you look at Tim Burton's career. Because, again, if his first feature film was Pee-wee's Big Adventure. Yeah, that's in, right. In the mid-'80s, right? Yeah. So, by Batman Returns, mm-hmm. right... You know, that, I think that was maybe his fifth or sixth feature film or something like that. He's definitely But, but his darker. career is going on so much that mm-hmm. it's like, at that point, he was like barely into his career. Yeah. So it's like he went on to do so much other stuff. Yeah. Um, I just mean signature-wise. Though some would like, argue his, his, his best films or his most famous films already happened by this point. Batman, Beetlejuice, Edward mm-hmm. Scissorhands. Yeah. Um, though I like, I'm not a huge fan of those films I just mentioned, except maybe for Beetlejuice, which I liked a lot more as a kid, and now I, I kind of don't like as much. But, yeah. But I'm trying to think of other films he did. Somehow, he didn't even direct this fucking movie. We're talking about his No, film. I know. It's just like... Goes I'm trying to think of his it, other, like, what, what would be something else in his, like, filmography that would be, like, if you were to list, like, the top five best or, like, most popular best? Tim Burton films? I don't know. I guess the things that I think about are probably the claymation, so Nightmare Before Christmas. Would you even direct? Frank and we. Well, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, that's true. It was Robert Fra- Zakis, right? No, no, um, no Henry uh, Selleck. Henry Selleck, yes. But yes. but um, I think he did. I think Tim Burton did direct Frank and Weenie. 
Franken movie. That, but that was like years later. Corpse Bride. He did direct Corpse Bride, um, yeah. Edward Scissorhands. Um, yeah, I don't know. Well, because oh, we also works. grew up, again, it's like... Well, yeah, we grew up with him. With, like, certain movies. So, like, yeah. we think certain movies are more important. Like, I'm sure someone who's born 10 years before or after us doesn't really give mm-hmm. two shits about Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Oh, but shit. actually, they like, kind of like that movie. Um, oh, no, that's fucking creepy. Um, no, but I think he's also kind of coming into his own, like, from Pee Wee's <laughs> Big Adventure movie to, like, what what was his latest thing recently? I don't know. I don't know if he directed like, it, but like he's, he was behind the Wednesday show, the Adams Family. Oh, the Wednesday. Okay, that's really cool. Where I don't think he directed. Um, I don't know if he directed any of the episodes, but I think he was like no, the producer, I don't think so, yeah. like the executive producer. There were like a lot of different. Which things. makes sense because I always think the Adams Family movies were directed by Tim Burton because they have like that aesthetic yeah. and vibe of like the '90s kind of like ni- family friendly no, macabre. He didn't do the, he no, he did. He did none of them. He had no involvement with any of them. <laughs> yeah, um, but he has nothing to do with this movie. So, Anywho, um, this it was here. distributed by Warner Brothers per use. Uh, it was released in June of 1995. Uh, it was made for a budget of about 100 million, and it grossed about 337 million dollars. So it was pretty nice. successful. They actually made money. All things considered, you know. Um, I'd like to pull up see if I have my little math and I have my spreadsheet that analyzes all the box office performances. <laughs> I should have pulled it up before, but I'm curious to compare it to the other two. Um, well, the first film was I, Gangbusters. Well, I remember the the Phantasm. It didn't. No, do no, I'm talking about the live action ones the in comparison. Oh, yeah, the the the, the animated ones did not do particularly. The animated one did not do particularly well. Um, but yeah, so the first film, I'm gonna just look at it as percent returns. Mm-hmm. Um, the first Batman, um, the percent return was like 757 percent return. Oh, nice. Um, Batman Returns was close to 300 percent, and this one's about 230 percent. Um, but this one, in terms of just sheer dollars, um, turned a bigger profit than Batman Returns, but still not as much as Batman. So my point being, though, is that it was comparable success. It wasn't like, mm-hmm. um, you know, it was a huge downgrade in terms of the return. Mm-hmm. Um, and I imagine this film was very merchandisable. Because it was a lot more colorful, I guess a lot so. more cartoony. I feel like they were able to sell a lot more more characters. I feel yeah. like they were able to sell a lot more stuff. So I bet there's a lot more money that this movie brought in. Yeah. Um, to kind of compensate for like the um, not as big of a box box office gross. Maybe stuff, right? But you wouldn't like get like a an an action figure or like a plush necessarily of like these characters, right? Like. Actually, a Batman of of Two Face, like oh, these guess. versions of Two Face, so. lunch boxes yeah. or oh, blankets. I feel like this film was a lot more, um, like if I was a kid, yeah, I could see me liking this one more than the other two, mm-hmm. just because it's brighter. Yeah, like I'm talking like if you're a young kid, like seven or something. Yeah, I think I. I don't know. But I'm also saying as an adult, as and I'm almost 20, 27. <laughs> and I, spoiler alert, I'm going to be contrarian. I actually like this one more than the other two live action ones we've watched. <laughs> the other two Tim Burton ones. And we'll get into it. Yeah. But I think just if you're like seven years old, it's bright. It's just visually keep yeah. your attention. But also like... The kit, all the, all the, it's like, it's like a live action cartoon. It's like what it feels like. Yeah. You well, know? Well, I was going to say, I mean, I have no, I didn't do any research to back this up, but I feel like this would be like a great thing to inspire like Halloween costumes. Like, oh, yeah. Oh, my gosh. Like, it's the Riddler so... and Two Face, like, you know, his, the, it... the side is all yeah. kooky. <laughs> it's really, but it's not just like, I don't know. It's, it's, there's this element, and and this is something I've been very interested in, in terms of, like, like really taking a step back and putting on, like, a media-critical lens and, mm-hmm. like, really, like, st- almost, like, studying, like, an academic topic, right? Yeah. When you look at the superhero genre, it's very, very interesting history, mm-hmm. right? Um, and I think this is more so... When you, basically, the coming of age of the genre is basically the 2000s. Yeah. But I call them, like, the long 2000s. So, like, from 98 with Blade mm-hmm. up until 2012 with the Avengers. Okay. Right? So, basically, like, that long decade sure. of the 2000s, right? Okay. And you see this more in this... I, I'm making a really roundabout point, but I'm going to bring it back. Yeah. Okay. I often think about in that decade, <laughs> there were films that came out that people maligned when they came out. Mm-hmm. 
and then apo- going back to them, mm-hmm. people, it's not like now they're masterpieces. They're like charming. But they have a little bit more, uh, people kind of have a little bit more fondness for them. Mm-hmm. For, because when they come out, like in 2002, mm-hmm. right, there's not many superhero films. So if there's one that's not great, people who really love this material and, and want to see the genre succeed are really frustrated mm-hmm. because it's like, this is all we have. Yeah. Don't make a bad one. But now we have so many, you're able to kind of go back and kind of like take these films for what they are yeah. and just appreciate them. So like, well, and I think I think going back to to X Men, uh, you know, similar type of situation. How like the the tone and everything, yeah. and and like action and and storyline. How like everything kind of does like. I wouldn't say a 180, but maybe it does like a 90. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like um, it's it's different. Like the first X Men film is a lot different than the last. It's a lot, of, a lot of experimental because yeah. you know it's not it's not so, uh, uh, well, it's a new thing you know outside of like the goofy Supermans yeah. and you know goofy like Batman's or yeah. whatever. Um, so yeah. So, so kind of applying that principle here, if you really dug the Tim Burton stuff, mm-hmm. in terms of at least for the 90s, it was really gritty. And more emotionally mature. Mm -hmm. And then this comes out. You're really frustrated because it's like, we don't have much Batman for me, media for me to consume. And this is not. In the movie, you're saying? Or just in general? I'm saying, like, in the media landscape in 1995, Mm -hmm. there's only like a handful of Batman movies. Yeah. And this is the most recent one. Isn't the show going on still? The show is going on, yes. but, But I'm saying it's easier in retrospect, like, you know, 20 years this later. Is, this is all to, they 25 have. years. It's where you can go back. It's like we've had like th- almost three decades of Batman films. Yeah. I don't have to watch mm-hmm. it with the lens of like, this isn't what I necessarily want or it checks all the boxes. Because mm-hmm. I have other Batman films to satisfy those needs. Yeah. So it's like yes, with yes, this, yes. I can just kind of appreciate like what it's trying to do saying, like, and it, weigh it on its it own merits. It may not like line up with their headcanon or, or like their it's idea like, well, it's like It's like the Star Batman. Wars movies where it's like when the prequels came out, it was like that was the only Star Wars that people thought they were going to get. Yeah. But now we've had, like, the sequels, and they made the spinoffs, and they have TV shows. So yeah. it's like people could go back to the prequels with a little bit more uh, tenderness mm-hmm. because it's like it doesn't have the pressure of, like, you are, like, the probably the last Star Wars thing to ever really exist. Mm-hmm. You have to be perfect, yeah. and you're not going to... And you're going to fall short. I mean, Similarly with this, I feel like, again, I did not... And I think this ties into the next I, point about our previous experience. Are those ones called the prequels, even though they're sequentially later in the timeline? No, no, no. The pre, the Star Wars prequels take place before the original trilogy. That's why I'm calling them the prequels. Like episode one, two, and oh, three. Oh, oh, I'm but, talking about Star Wars prequels. Oh, you're, okay, okay. I thought, the, the, I the thought, Star Wars prequels I came out like the saying, 90s to the thousand. Yeah, I thought you were saying the original ones were, that was it. So it's like. No, no, no. I'm saying like in the early 2000s. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Like, like you didn't know there were going to be more Star Wars movies after Episode One, Two, and Three. Yes. Okay. So it was really frustrating because it was like this is like this is how we're going out. Yeah. And, right. But um. Anyway. Anyway, but I think this ties into the next point about previous experience. Um, I had mm-hmm. never seen this movie. I knew about it, and I knew about this, and then the next Joel Schumacher one, which we're gonna watch next. Spoiler alert. Um, it's just being like punchy bags. He does both. No? Yeah. Nice. Well, this one again, this one does pretty well. Mm-hmm. Uh. Uh. Um, financially, yeah, I, I forget. We'll, we'll get to. I forget how critics at the time reacted. Mm-hmm. But over time, again, this one and more so the next one really became punching bags, um, emblematic of like wh- a bad superhero movie. Oh, um, <laughs> to the point that basically it then led to like the Christopher Nolan interpretations, which is like a complete one. You talk about one eighties. <laughs> it's like it's like one eighty. And then enters a different dimension, and then goes Aww. like, you know what I mean? So we liked it, Joel. We we did so, but because of that, <laughs> I had never seen them, and I know, and I had no intention of really ever watching them, um, except maybe yeah. for just out of like curiosity. So I don't even know if I knew if this existed. That, yeah, right? I was gonna ask because I feel like, <laughs> which is so weird because there's like, there's like some top talent, you know, That's especially the in the '90s, like. That's the, <laughs> yeah, like... Um, How did I not know this existed? Um, well, yeah, because I think by the time you came of age, because, mm-hmm. like, not not to date you, but you were, <laughs> so, so you were born in 1999. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. by the time you're, like, eight years old... Yeah. Batman Begins has already come out. Dark mm-hmm. Knight's coming out in a year. There's yeah. been, like, two or three different animated shows. You already, even if you're not watching all that stuff... 
you mm-hmm. have you're by the time you come of age. Yeah. And by coming of age, I just mean like become like sentient. Almost, yes, yes, I suppose yes. being like three years old. You, there's already a cultural understanding of Batman mm-hmm. that has already like left this in the that dust. That I don't need to. Yeah, well, that has already I, left I this in interpretation like, in the dust. You yeah, know? and I wasn't like super into superheroes either. Um, yeah, so so yeah, I guess that makes sense. It's like I know Batman, you know, like I know it exists or whatever. It's like, but you don't know like. The story yeah. or, like, the, the history yeah. or whatever. All the and, installments. And while I feel this film is unfairly maligned, uh, I... If you're, like... If you told me historically... <laughs> people kind of forget about these interpretations of this character because of the Nolan films. I'm like, yeah, because the Nolan films are fucking incredible. Like, you know what I mean? Like, they're, they're not just, like, some of the be- best Batman films. They're not just some of the best superhero films. They're, the best, they're some of the best films ever made. Yeah, he's good with films. So in he's, general, yeah. That's what I'm saying. I, this, my least favorite Christopher Nolan movie, I still like. <laughs> like, there's no Christopher Nolan films I hate. Was I think it, I've seen every it, single that, one. Was that Ambulance movie? Was that Christopher Nolan? No. Ambulance. So that was Michael Bay. Oh, Michael Bay. Tenet. Was his Tenet? last one before. We're recording this in July, so Bar- Barbenheimer's upon us. Barbenheimer. Um, so by the time you listen to this, it's already come out. But um, So I get to see Oppenheimer. I have two... I have tickets for two different nights for it. I'm going to see he's it opening gonna, night in New gonna York. He's going to see it twice, and he he hasn't even seen it. Because I know it's going to be fucking incredible. You know, like, to well, be like, I'm oh, a huge I want to see it film. Twice. Like, I try not to be pretentious <laughs> about film, even though I can't help it sometimes. And for those of you cinephiles out there, I'm seeing it at. You, you know, did go to NYU, so, you know, yeah. the, the pretentiousness is. No, but there's a pretentiousness. It's, it's built in. It's, but it's, but what I like about Christopher Nolan films, at least as of late, is because he films them almost like more and more. Each film he's filming more, on the IMAX 70 oh, millimeter, IMAX, IMAX. which is like, so, like the largest film format. It's like so crystal clear. And when they project it, like mm-hmm. it's not just they film it and then project it digitally. When they project the film stock, which I think they said is like 11 miles for this movie because it's like three hours long. <laughs> it's like the longest. And they showed the canister because the film stock is also so big. Yeah. It's Huge. It doesn't even fit. They had to make a new thing to fit the canister. Oh, I thought they just have multiple. I think for this one, it's so big. <laughs> it's literally like the size of like like our. I don't even know how big it is. But anyway, my point being, <laughs> he films like like when you watch it, if you sit in the middle and you and you sit perfectly where you can't see the rest of the theater peripheral, mm-hmm. it feels like you're there. Yeah. I know people have been saying that since the fucking 60s when, like, they get, a, <laughs> like, a bigger in, a like, their TV goes coming, bigger. Yeah. Like, the, the, the TV screen's, like, three inches bigger. Yeah. It's, like, a 20-inch TV, and they're like, like it feels on. like you're there. Pause. I have to cough. Oh. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> I'm just being honest, that might be hard to cut out, because I was in mid-ramble. Sorry. That's start okay. the, Start that sentence again. <laughs> um, <laughs> all, all I'm saying is... That the uh, if you sit in a certain place, we're really going off the rails here. But but yeah, it's like there there's nothing. It, it feels like there, you're there. There's no yeah. Like I saw Dunkirk in the first shot is them walking down a street. It's like a head on just shot. It I I know it sounds like a cliche, but I cannot mean it more. It felt like I could just get up and walk down the street. <laughs> it was so beautiful. Yeah. Right. Anyway, my point with this <laughs> is that I'm going to see it. At AMC Lincoln Square, which has the, which will project on 70 millimeter. <laughs> I'm seeing it the Thursday night at 11 fucking 30 at night. I take, I have the next day off. Oy. And then we're, her, Viviana and I are going to see it. I'm going to see it again with her Saturday night at like 10 30. And then we're going to see Barbie in between. And those were the, um, those are the only available times. No, no, there were later times, but like a week later. Oh, yeah. And I was like, I don't want to wait a week. Oy. So. But I was able to get us good tickets, like good yeah. good seats, as yeah. opposed to being like in the front. But anyway, my point with all of this, <laughs> I think you've seen Christopher Nolan. My point is with this is He's that a real auteur. I understand why this film and the other one, especially in contrast, mm-hmm. were forgotten. And and I understand to a point why they were maligned because they're you know uh, they're just a very different elk. They're silly in comparison. They're very silly. Well, they're, they're silly in general. But. They're. Yeah, but this is like the Adam West one, but like with a huge budget. Yeah. Because again, let me look at what well, the budget for the Adam West, and obviously the inflation, it was different. It was like three decades apart, but the Adam West one was made for a million dollars. This one was made for a hundred million dollars. Oh. And again, obviously, I'm sure it's that. But the point is that even even adjusting for inflation, it's it's a huge no difference. No fake shark here, baby. Yeah, no fake shark here. Well, at least 
if well, it would be a fake shark, but you know. Sorry. Um. My phone went. Yeah, but, I thought we were supposed to silence our toys. Uh, I did. It's on silent. Um, but it uh, it feels like the Adam West one, but with like a huge budget. Mm-hmm. Um, and and I, we were watching it, and I was like, "Why is this more cartoony than the literal cartoon we watched last time?" It's so like, campy. It is so so campy, campy ridiculous. Everything is though. to like the nth degree. I kind of love it though. It's like. <laughs> But that's what I'm saying. It's like, I, I, it's, it's at least more interesting. I find it more fun to watch. And I don't mean yeah. it like a, like, oh, you just turn off your brain. I, I can't, I'm not some, saying it, it's dumb. No, I fun. mean. Well, it is. I think, but, it, I think it's an, I think, well, spoiler alert. I, I think it's more I, artistically it's interesting. It's okay movie, but it's like, yeah, it's like very in- engaging. And I, I find the creative choices yeah. more interesting. Yes, yes, yes. Than the, than the Tim Burton ones. Yes. Um. Why don't I give you some background though? Yeah. Okay. I, I yeah. could see. I could look. Uh, I could see the look on your face. Okay. You want some background? Yeah. Okie dokie. Okay. Doggy. Okay. So in terms of the development, Batman Returns, which was the last live action one. So if I say the last one, forget the animated one. I'm talking about like kind of this live action. Okay. Okay. Because they're kind of the same universe. Yes. Because it's like you have like the, yeah. It's like the Tim Burton, the Burton verse. The Burton verse. <laughs> uh, so Batman Returns was released in '92 uh, with financial success and generally favorable reviews from critics, but Warner Brothers was disappointed with its box office run, having made 150 million dollars less than the first film. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think we talked about it last time. You could probably chalk that up to the fact it was a little bit darker yeah. than the previous one. So I think uh, to, for a movie to be uber successful, it's mm-hmm. not getting as many people to go. It's, it's about getting many people to go more than one. Yeah. Right? So yeah. I think the issue of Batman Returns was either it scared really little kids or kind of bored slightly older kids. Mm-hmm. Like maybe if you were like 11, you might be kind of bored. I know Batman it might Returns. be kind of random or like kind of not so relevant, but like I think the seasonal thing is also weird. Like, are you going to go multiple times to watch a essentially a Christmas movie like in July in whatever July it was, whatever it was yeah in June. <laughs> like no you know it's kind of and then Vest the Phantasm was released like on Christmas Day so they wasn't had, it they had something like that so they had the capability I don't know it was it's very different it's um the the film especially now with COVID like when films are released just kind of shifting yeah but I know for like the longest time the fall was like Oscar season mm-hmm Right. It was only in 2015 when The Force Awakens <laughs> broke yeah. tra- Star Wars tradition. Because all the Star Wars films had been released November, like in May. Right. It was like December. It was like December. a week before Christmas. Mm-hmm. But they did gangbusters. Yeah. So the, so suddenly people realized like, oh, like you could do a big, if it's like, if it's the right blockbuster, it could be a huge behemoth because it's like the Christmas season and families yeah. will go multiple times. Yeah. And, well, and the, yeah, people are home. Stuff like well, I was gonna say, think about it, this is a very small sliver of the market, but think about college. Like I was, that was my freshman year of college, yeah. so I saw it with family, and then I saw it with friends from college, and then mm-hmm. I saw it like, like you know what I mean. Like you saw it multiple times. Yeah. But anyway, yeah. Anyway, uh, after Batman Returns was deemed too dark and inappropriate for children, with McDonald's even recalling their Happy Meal tie-in. <laughs> so, so the fact that the last one was darker kind of oh hurt merchandising. Warner Brothers decided that this was the primary cause of the film's financial results and asked Burton to step down as director. So it sounds mm. like they... While Sam Raimi um, would later go... who uh, So they considered other directors. Sam Raimi, who would later go on to direct the first Spider-Man film in 2002. Mm-hmm. Uh, and John McTiernan, who directed Predator and Die Hard. Mm-hmm. Um... Which you've both seen. Which you've seen both of. Uh, Predator is the one. Yeah, in, I think in like in like South America. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With, with Arnold Schwarzenegger. Like invis- invisible. Yes. Yeah. And then yeah. Die Hard. The Bruce Die Willis. Hard, yeah. yeah um, so both those directors were considered, um, but ultimately Joel Schumacher was selected by Warner Brothers after his work in The Client, which I guess is a film he did, and approval from Burton. Um, yeah, good job. Husband and wife screenwriting duo Lee and Janet Scott Bachelor. Uh, spelled B A T C H L E R, but it sounds like when I like, when I read out loud, I'm like, oh, bachelor. Like, <laughs> um, th- this this um. That's how it should be spelled. The t- the two of them were brought on to write the script. In a meeting with Burton, they agreed that quote the key element to Batman is his duality. It's not just that Batman is Bruce Wayne. Like it's meant to be like, I guess like what? really exploring that duality. Which uh, this film, a duality really, of what? Just that it's like you have these two sides of you. I don't know. That's very. That's very. Well, yeah. I feel like Batman and Bruce Wayne. 
I don't know. I feel like what? that's just like the obligatory <laughs> thing to say when you're making a Batman film. It's like it's, we really want to explore the duality. It's like yeah, no shit. Like well, sure, sure. Oh, sorry. I just had a thing go off. So I, I'm gonna mute. I yell at you. This, I did have it this, muted, but I had then I unmuted it to check the sound levels. So this, I apologize. This this is a very yes. We're doing this unconventionally. We're doing yeah. This we're doing it in the during morning. During the day. Technically. Shh. That's it. Yes. Uh, during the day in the morning. On a normal, a normal work day, <laughs> where other things are happening. Don't say a work day. <laughs> uh, Keaton initially approved the selection of Schumacher. So uh, for a start, Keaton was maybe going to return as Batman. No. Yeah. Michael Keaton. Um, he initially approved the selection of Schumacher as director and planned on reprising his role as Batman from the first two films. Schumacher claims he originally had in mind an adaptation of Frank Miller's Batman Year One, which we talked about before, which is basically like um, a, a very famous y- yes. comic, uh, like yeah. a run of Batman. Um, exploring like that initial like first year of yeah, year one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and Keaton claimed that he was enthusiastic about the idea. Warner Brothers rejected the idea as they wanted a sequel, not a prequel. Uh. Um, producer Peter McGregor Scott represented the studio's aim in making a film for the MTV generation <laughs> with full merchandising appeal. Um, again, I gotta fucking say, like, I, I want merch for this. <laughs> you want merch? Of all, I, of, I like, like I I've never watched a movie as an adult, and like, it's it's rare I watch a movie as an adult and be like, I want merch from this. Yeah. This is like, this is one of them. I loved the Riddler's sparkly outfit. <laughs> well, can we talk about the Riddler has like seven different outfits? He does, like he, he, he does. keeps like evolving. It gets like more and more ridiculous. Like <laughs> that's the thing. Like it feels almost like self parody. Like it's like, but I, I don't know if they're doing yeah, it. Like, like the la- like the last one. Like it just seems like so silly. Like. Like, why did she eat a bird? You know, like. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> why did he eat a fish? Like. <laughs> when they were hungry. Um, so in terms of casting, Keaton decided not to repl- uh, excuse me, not to reprise Batman because he did not like the direction the series was headed in and rejected the script. A decision was made to go with a younger actor for Bruce Wayne and an offer was made to Ethan Hawke, who turned it down. Oh. Um, which would have been interesting. Yeah. Schumacher had seen Val Kilmer in Tombstone, which I guess was a film but was also interested <laughs> in Keanu Reeves, Alec, or William Baldwin, uh, Dean Cain, uh, Tom Hanks. Tom uh, D- Hanks! Also, Dean Cain, uh, I don't know if it was before or after this, Dean Cain played Superman on a TV show called yeah. uh, Lois, and, <laughs> Lois and Clark. Is it Lewis and Clark? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, there was, it was a TV show where it was almost, it was about Superman, but it was almost like a rom-com, sitcom version. Okay. Not a sitcom like Friends where it's like an audience and like no, laughing, yeah, yeah, but yeah. Yeah. like um, it was, was much. Like, sorry, I'm clearing my. Th- I don't know. I got like some allergies or something going on. So. That's okay. Um, <laughs> but yeah, Tom Hanks, Kurt Russell, Kurt Ralph Russell. Fiennes, Daniel Day Lewis, and Johnny Depp. What? Um, like it's just like a who's who of like the mid '90s. Yeah, actors. that's like, so random. I think when they do, I think whenever they cast Batman, they just make a list of like who's the most like famous actors right now and then let's just like see what it would be like because sure. like yeah they maybe consider Tom Hanks but I don't know how far along like they may have done them been like I don't know but so Tom Hanks is a good actor you never know that's you know true what I mean? they did replace they did replace Marty like kind of mid filming like you know oh oh yeah yeah like yeah like in, in Back to the Future oh so. yeah I might, I'm saying but even before you get to that point just like no yeah I, I just feel like that would be a miscast yeah like in so many ways um, like I don't know Burton uh, really, because I guess he's still kind of create, somewhat involved. He, he really pushed for Depp to get the role. Mm-hmm. Um, Kilmer, who as a child visited the studios where the 1960s Batman series was recorded, and shortly before... Um, this this is separate from the 60s, but I, I also read in the trivia, and I'm reading it now here, that like right before like he was signed on to be Batman, mm-hmm. he had visited like a bat cave in Africa... For, for, like, another film or something. I think he got oh. the call while he was there, like, in ah. doing a shoot. Um, he was contacted by his agent for the role. Kilmer signed on without reading the script or knowing who the director was. Ah. He, just, he just wanted to be Batman. He was like, it's a sign, baby. It's a sign. Um, Billy D. Williams took the role of Harvey Dent in the first film. Yeah. Basically solely for the possibility of eventually portraying Two-Face in a, in a sequel. Yeah, we did think, t- talk about that. Um, but Schumacher cast Tommy Lee Jones in the role instead. Miscast, let me tell you. Tommy Lee Jones? Yeah. I... I'm sorry. I don't know if he's miscast. He does really well. He's a good... He's a great actor. I I don't know much about the character of Two-Face from the comics. Like, my only real experience with Two-Face is... 
The Dark Knight version. Yeah, the, the crystal, yeah. Which I feel like you shouldn't really use as, like, the Batman litmus With the, test. the blonde guy. Right? Yeah, Aaron yeah. Eckhart. Yeah. Um, and then a little bit of the animated series. Mm. Um, I feel like in this, and we'll talk about in the trivia, like, he kind of feels almost like Joker light. Yeah. In a lot of ways. And, and fans complained about that. That, like, it kind of... It kind of like how he's supposed to be. No, no, he's. Oh. I he's, thought I thought all of Batman's like people were like, like kind of like on the verge of like a nervous like, breakdown. Like, basically. Yeah, kind of like supposed to be like kind of deranged and like kind of like all over the place. Like they're they're all meant to be like criminally insane. You know, but like, but like, not in the way where it's like what's her name Harley. You know, Penguin. No. Like they're like a Joker, Riddler. Like they're all silly. You know, so like they're, they're not out. meant to all be like maniacal laugh. Like I feel like if if you just think a Batman villain is someone who maniacally laughs and is kind of like like <laughs> With crazy, a colorful costume. then then yeah, you're off base. I, I again, I'm not. I, I can't speak to how the character is meant to be portrayed, like based off the comics. Yeah, but um. I feel like, at the very least, he kind of just feels like a Joker character in terms of, like, yeah. the, mani- the, the and mania. I, I think that's what I'm saying is feels miscast. I don't know if it's, like, just my own experience with, like, Tommy's work, but, like... Tommy! Like, Tommy Lee Jones' work, but, like, he just doesn't seem like a maniacal or, like, kind of, like, off you know, the hinges type of, like, actor or, like, like being able to portray that in, like, an, in- an interesting and engaging way, the way that, like, like it was kind of unfair that, like, his counterpart was Jim Carrey, like, <laughs> where yeah. he's, like, so silly. Like, like it would have been so better if Two-Face was, it. like, a fo- like really, se- like, more of a foil for Jim Carrey. Yeah, like, if, if he was still very, like, what was he, a DA? Like, very, like official like but like now evil or something like i don't know it just it seemed wrong that like when Tom, yeah tommy was like trying to do that you know well, he was being like really wacky and zany and it yeah it just seemed like out of place when he was trying, yeah. when he was being because even in the animated series he's like really he's meant to be quite menacing okay almost like he's turned like from da to like a gangster almost like, okay. And gangster, not gangsta. Like you know, like a like a, <laughs> like a classic, like for like a mob. Yes, yes, guy. yes. Um, so I think that would have maybe worked better. Though I think I I think, to be fair, I think Tommy Lee Jones commits. No, he does. He commits. And he, to this. I, yeah, he he's really, a great actor, and that that's what I'm saying. It's like I'm not I'm not bagging on his performance. I think it was great, but I think it was just like I don't think it's good acting. Not, but it's it's the tried. most acting. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, like, he definitely got into it, and and you can see that. I think the further along yeah. the movie goes, like in the in the beginning, it was like really weird for me. Mm-hmm. But like as it went on, I was like, okay, I can buy into yeah. this a little bit. But it was it just still seemed like yeah. off. Something like, else I, I didn't understand that again. Maybe this is from the comics, but he, I don't remember. From other versions, him having like a split personality, like the idea that like, he speaks like in the like we, like he speaks I guess in the it's plural, just like to amp it up. I guess so. I don't, I don't remember. Like, but it, it was if you're gonna do that, it would have been cool to see like it flip back and forth. Yeah, like a jack. Because when you first introduce, like for ninety percent of the movie, he's like at eleven. Yeah. But his first scene, he's giving like this really like like quiet speech to like his hostage or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And then when they flipped him being like, ah, I was like, oh, that's interesting. He'll kind of like flip back and forth. But then he just like yeah. stayed at the wacky. Like he never went back to that. Yeah. And I was like, because that's a good use of Tommy Lee Jones's skill. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Because who's he play in movies? Like detectives, lawyers, yeah. politicians. I think, I like, think that's why I like. And he's always like a good orator. Yeah. So it's like, it's like. So you get you get to have your cake and eat it too, where you get to take advantage of Tommy Lee Jones' natural obvious skills, mm-hmm. but then kind of get let him play against type and play with this kind of wacky comedic character, but kind of have him play both yeah. and go back and forth. But they didn't really I, do that, so I was that was a little disappointing. Yeah, and I I think that I think you're touching on something that kind of goes or, or or is maybe what I'm thinking of because like the other side of him is so 
it's it's not as realistic as like the the Christopher Nolan ones. No. So it's it's more. It kind of reminds me of like Joker and in what was it batman 89 when he gets the acid 89 on. yeah um when, that's what the fans call it is that what, just called okay. batman so okay. to distinguish so it they batman. say batman 89 okay yeah in batman 89 because there's like the prosthetics kind of making the smile exaggerated and stuff like that yeah. so like I talk about talk about the makeup in this one yeah but so i feel like some something someone like kind of like a jack nicholson can like play it straight but then also but let like, the makeup do the work for him but then also be able to do what you're saying and like act differently, act maniacally in some way, like at times, and then act more like straight on and like like I don't know, straight edge or whatever yeah. it's called. Um, but yeah, so it just seemed weird seeing Tommy be so silly. But he was pretty silly, and he was reluctant to do the do it. Yeah, to accept the role, but um, he did so at his son's insistence. Well, that's fun. Probably because it's like he wanted to see his dad as Two Face in 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 a Batman yeah in a Batman movie. Um, in terms of the filming of this movie, uh, Schumacher and Kilmer clashed while they were making making it. Uh, Schumacher described Kilmer as quote childish and impossible, <laughs> reporting that he fought with various crewmen and refused to speak to Schumacher for two weeks after the director told him to stop being rude. <laughs> oh, um, Kilmer. Oh, um, Schumacher also mentioned Tommy Lee Jones as a source of trouble. Uh, Jim Carrey was a gentleman and Tommy Lee was threatened by him. I'm tired of defending overpaid, overprivileged actors. I pray I don't work with them again. Oh. <laughs> Carrey later acknowledged that Jones was, in fact, not friendly to him, telling him once offset during the production, quote, I hate you. I really don't like you. I cannot sanction your buffoonery. <laughs> what? What were they so Tommy doing? Lee Jones, I think Tommy Lee Jones just didn't like Jim Carrey's, like, whole stick, shtick, like his, like, whole aura. Yeah, whatever. yeah. No, I can see how he can be annoying, like, like every day so, on set, like yeah, that's just like he's. I wonder acting. if he's like that. I wonder if he's like that, like when he's not. He's acting and it's amped up, but he's he's silly like that. Like if you like watch him in interviews or whatever, he's like he's pretty goofy. Yeah, he's he's a goofy guy. Yeah, Tom. Imagine like like the ego hit. I cannot sanction your buffoonery. That's a fucking. <laughs> Wait, who, I might have to put Tommy Lee Jones Car- said that to Jim Carrey. Oh, I thought. No, Tommy oh, Lee oh, Jones oh, is it, like oh, finds him too the, silly. The 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 sentence looked like yeah. Car- no. Carrie said that to Jones. No, no, no. That's so silly. No, no. Tommy Lee Jones is like <laughs> I think it was just like you. Like, I you played stand an joke. FBI agent for aliens, and but you he played can. it straight. But he played <laughs> it straight though. <laughs> and you can't. <laughs> you literally your your counterparts were aliens and a talking dog. And, you, and a talking dog. You can't. But he wasn't silly. Everyone else was silly. (laughs) And also, he didn't have to see the aliens. They were CGI. He didn't have to see them on set. (laughs) That's even worse. Um, Oh my gosh. Anyways, third, third. Also, we pointed out, we we noticed third green outfit. People love putting Jim in a green outfit. Oh, yeah, the mask. The the mask, the Grinch, and the Riddler. And he plays them all. When was the mask? I think it was before this. I think the mask was 94. 94. Yeah, let me look it up. The Mask film. 94. 94. 94. So, so, yeah, so he had done The Mask by this point. When was this? 95, right? So it was yeah. Like well, I think at this point he had, he had, I think Dumb and Dumber had come out. I think Ace Ventura. Like, he had, he mm-hmm. had kind of done, like, those, like, classic early Jim Carrey movies by this mm-hmm. point, I believe. Yeah. Um, and I'm not trying to typecast him either, because I think he can he can do lots Oh, of stuff. yeah, I mean, if you look at Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless yeah, Mind, exactly. it com- plays completely against <laughs> type, right? Yeah, but I, um, I think he just, he does that. I don't know. He's he's just so good. He's just, like, so good. I don't know. I really like Jim Carrey in those silly roles. Like, I think he just, like, does really well. And this is very much, like, even in his sillier later stuff, there's, like, a very specific thing about, like, early Jim Carrey. Mm-hmm. Which I find a little insufferable. Like, I don't really like Ace Ventura. I've never seen that. I I think I watched it once as a kid. Even as a kid, I didn't really like it. The pet detective thing? Yeah, it's just like... It's just like... It's not that it's goofy. It's that, like, I feel like there's no heart. No, yeah. Some, like, I don't some feel stuff it. But for like, this, it works because he's, like, the villain. But Ace yeah. Ventura... And I, I haven't seen Dumb and Dumber, but I should because it's, no, it's yeah. Rhode Island. Because it's... Um, it was filmed in Rhode Island. It's well. It's directed by the Farley brothers, who are from Rhode Island. Oh, oh, oh. So like all their movies, not all of them, but a lot of them are Rhode Island, based in Rhode Island, or yeah. they really shot there. But no. but, oh. but my point being is that like I always feel like there there's like nothing underneath. Yeah. Whereas with this is exactly the same, yeah. but he's the villain, so like I don't mind as much. 
much. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think I would agree. I mean, like, not... I'm not saying I love everything that Jim Carrey has ever done, and, and some stuff is, like, really stupid and, like, kind of annoying. And, like, you know, but... Um, and, and I haven't seen everything. Like I said, I haven't seen Ace Ventura or Dumb and Dumber, um, which just both look really dumb. <laughs> like, I don't know. Um, but, like... I don't know. I just feel like in these, in those three roles specifically, like it just comes so naturally. Yeah. Cause like, like you can tell when people are trying really hard, but like there's just something about like he, like his little facial expressions, like his, like he makes it look effortless. Yeah. There, yeah. He has like this gen, like it's kind of pretentious, but like he has this kind of like je ne sais quoi about him that like. Mm-hmm. Is so natural, whereas like he's the secret like, sauce. You yeah, can't teach it. You just like, have it. Or you don't have it. Yeah, or like with Jack Nicholson, you can like kind of tell it's more of a it's more performative. Um, whereas like I felt like with Jim Carrey, it's like I don't know. It's just like him. Like, yeah. I don't know. It's weird. I can't explain it, but I thought he did really well. You're and, saying anyway. Jim Carrey, you're so good at playing crazy freaks because you are crazy. <laughs> Um, and but, he, but, I don't think he would deny that. But yeah, the casting, <laughs> I think, again... He's great. <laughs> for for what it is, being like this goofy, campy, almost feels like a throwback to the 60s stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, I think wall-to-wall, the casting is almost perfect in this. Mm-hmm. Again, like, I, I like Tommy I Lee Jones. Val. Um, Val. Well, I have some thoughts about Val. I think he's a better Batman mm-hmm. than, than Michael Keaton was. Mm-hmm. But as Bruce, he's pretty vanilla and bland like he doesn't really emote all that much is that i feel like that may just be bruce no because it's not that he's not expressive i'm just saying like i don't really feel like there's anything on like it feels like they just pointed the camera and and told him okay say don't go in there and action don't go in there (laughs) you know what i mean like like it just it, it doesn't feel like he's really i don't know Maybe it was an acting choice to be really reserved. I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't know. It just I, feels I, a little boring. No, I understand what you're saying, and I think I'm... I Because even the Christian Bale ones, bit. he's still has a personality. I guess so, As yeah. Bruce Wayne, you know? We'll, we'll see, we'll see, like, um, uh, what's his name? Christian Bale's interpretation, I think, uh, will mm-hmm. get a better understanding, but yeah. I don't know. It just seems like Bruce is just kind of like... Like a piece of butter, like. <laughs> but see, but that's not. But that that's. I think it's indicative of the films we watched. That most of them, except for Mask of the Phantasm, has really sidelined Bruce. Mm-hmm. Um, but oh, but I think I remember saying in Mask of the Phantasm is that that is really hard to not make him a piece of toast. Yeah, exactly. So like, it's like it's like such an internal struggle that you you yeah. somehow have to subtly bring out and well, into actions. Let me give you an example. Without blowing your cover. Let me give you an example. Right? Because here's the thing is that he's meant to be as Bruce. Like, well, really when we say Bruce, we're talking about two people. Mm-hmm. And I'm not talking about Batman. There's okay. the Bruce who is Batman. Yeah. But he's not dressed as Batman. Like the Bruce like in the Batcave or he's talking to Alfred about something. Yeah, Bruce. Just, and then but then like there's the, the playboy boy. billionaire, right? Yeah. That, you know... Let's like using the example of let's say like looking ahead the Robert Pattinson version. Mm-hmm. They specifically like and they talk about this in interviews was like this version of Batman is he's only like in his second year of being Batman. Mm-hmm. So he hasn't really developed the Playboy persona quite yet. Rob. Yes, okay. Robert Pattinson. Yeah. So when he's Bruce Wayne, he's just like emo. Yeah. Yeah. But that's like at least a choice. Yeah. Whereas this movie is trying, is like on paper, he's like meant to be like the same Michael, like the Playboy billionaire version of Bruce. Yeah. But he's not doing anything with the character. He's not really like leaning yeah. into that characterization. Uh, they don't really have. They don't really have the. Um, I don't think they really like give him the situations to show that. Whereas like in the, mm. in the Mask of the Phantasm, like. He's at a soiree and like there's like girls surrounding him and stuff. So so I think in a way the whole Playboy situation, like if, if you were to defend the kind of like flatness, would be that like he doesn't do anything yet. There everyone's still like attracted to him, like whether you know for his money basically. But like mm-hmm. he doesn't really have to try hard. Um, but then also, I think just, like, Rob Patterson is just, like, kind of, like, a better face actor. Like, 
Like with Twilight, like Robert Pattinson's like one of the best actors of his generation, but he's just been like in schlock for like ten years. Yeah, it's it's like really <laughs> it's so hard to describe because it's so subtle, but it's just like he he can do something that like makes it not just plainly emo, like like you can see like other stuff behind yeah. his eyes somehow. Well, it's actually interesting when he was cast as Batman. It's so weird. Because <laughs> um, he was in the Christopher Nolan film Tenet. Okay. As kind of like a suave British agent guy. Oh. So people were like, because when Robert Pattinson was first cast as Batman, people were like, what? Like, why are they casting like this Twilight, mm-hmm. like teen heartthrob? Like he can't. Oh, but then. But the people watched Tenet and they were like, he can actually play the, do the Playboy billionaire thing kind of well. He could yeah. play that. He didn't really get to do that in the Batman. Mm-hmm. But, but, um. So, so your argument is basically the material here doesn't really give him Val Kilmer much to do. I, I agree with you to a point, but I think there's still I think he just he just Michael Keane at least also didn't have much to do, but he just like had like a natural uh, charisma that I think yeah. Val Kilmer doesn't. Not that he doesn't have, because I've seen him in other movies. I kind of liked Val, and he and he has a a different kind. Of, like I think I've only ever seen him in the Top Gun movies. Yeah, I and that's a different no kind of charisma because he's meant to kind of be like the the bully, like the kind Ice of asshole. Man or whatever. Yeah, Ice Man. But I don't, I don't know him like at all. I mean, like you said about Top Gun, and I remembered him from that. But has he been in like anything? He else? was pretty so, big like, in the nineties, and I think he really tapered off. Oh, okay. And now he has throat cancer, I think, which is really. Sad. Oh, was that real? Yeah, oh, that's why in, he in was. Top Gun. Oh. Um. In fact, in Top Gun, <laughs> I believe like you, they're communicating with the computer. Yes, um, yes, yes. But then he does say, like, one or two sentences, like, for emphasis at mm-hmm. the end of the conversation. I believe he didn't actually say I don't. I don't believe he can talk in real life. I think they, mm-hmm. they used AI oh. to replicate his voice to and just have, like, move your lips like you're saying this stuff, and then we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll put it in. It seems like I've seen, I've seen stuff where he's been a voice actor. Uh, so Wasn't he in Prince of Egypt? Yeah, Prince of Egypt. Who uh, was he in Prince of Egypt? Moses? Oh, I have no idea. Um... I think it was Moses. Yes, Moses and God. Well, yeah, because I think the whole idea. Yes, yes, but um, yeah, in planes, but um, a lot of these like live action ones where I would like know him, like know his face or whatever. I haven't seen these. Yeah. Um, yeah, he was probably he was much bigger in the nineties. I think he kind of tapered off. Well, there's um, some stuff in the in the two thousands. Yeah, I'm not saying he wasn't in anything. <laughs> I'm just saying I think his star power probably was. You know, this is kind of like. Around that time. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I think overall, just, like, I think at least good... If, if nothing else for the visuals, mm-hmm. I think phenomenal casting across yeah. the board. Um, I think I think he was... He's a good... Bruce, like, he's, like... No, I'm sorry, Michael Keaton, but he, he's, like, he's, like, a little bit more, like, attractive. You like, believe he's, like, a hot... Yeah. Yeah, yeah, um, you know. Michael Keaton's, like, a very specific look. Yeah. Not that Unconventionally he, attractive. He, not we'll that say. he's ugly or anything but i think just like the the i don't know like the straight edge like i don't know strong jaw like the little glass is like i don't know it just like it's kind of nerdy yes Whereas but, Bruce but not in like nerdy. a steve jobs way no like just in like a, a nerdy. cool billionaire way like oh no i'm saying i think it's like a steve jobs oh way. like i, I think he, he looked he was like a little too like nerdy and kind of like i don't know i thought he, i thought he was cute i thought he i thought he did the funny little things um. Yeah, like when he was when he was like smiling or like like doing that little smirk as Batman. That was silly. Mm-hmm. Like you know, he has, <laughs> yeah. he has those little things, you know. Um, something that we haven't really talked about this movie. Um, and normally we wouldn't really it wouldn't really matter. Um, but Joel Schumacher is gay. Oh my God! The amount of bulges in this movie. The I, I, and like, look, the I'm size. For I'm oh. for it. Oh my God. It's but I think it's part of this conversation, and it was again. This is one of the things people maligned the this and the next film for was how how homoerotic they were. Um, I guess or are so. I should say. Um, I guess so. But you know, people say that about Top Gun. Is, are dudes just being nice to each other? Is that? Scene is no, it's like it's like, like this weird <laughs> physical. No, but this like really is like homo. Like it's not even subtext, right? Where it's like know. crotch shots, oh huge bulges. They're when, so when he, big. When Batman puts I, the one, like the the the, the butt 
crotch shot. Well, I was going to say, the crotch shots and the bulge or whatever, like, it's not like he zooms in on just the crotch. It's just because it's so big you notice it. Yeah. But the butt shot is what got me. So if you haven't seen this movie, <laughs> near the end, Batman puts on, like, a new outfit, and they're doing close-ups of all of, like, the different p- parts of it, like the the... Like the the gloves, well, the chest was, plate. Yeah. But then they do one where he literally turns around and they have like plastic butt cheeks. <laughs> and they, it, they say it fills the whole screen. Honestly, I think it just adds to the campiness, but it is kind of... It well, is, I'm full, I like it. That's it the is thing, noticeable. Is I like it. And it's not that it's like bad or like inappropriate, I don't think, because like they are tight outfits, right? So it only makes sense. But it's just like... Jesus Christ! <laughs> Are they yeah. the, the only one with the little bulge was Jim Carrey. <laughs> yeah, it, it was like, and also like the lawn. There's like a scene, like I wrote laundry scene, like when when Robin's doing laundry and he's like oh dancing and like he's like, it's like a very, it feels like a music video Is and it's that like how very, they do laundry in the circus. <laughs> And look, this isn't this isn't What's saying that anything. necessary. <laughs> this is not a critique. I'm not saying this is a bad thing by any, you know, in any sense, right? Um, I think it's just something that I think should be discussed because it adds to the personality and identity of this film, right? Yeah, um, yeah. But again, I think it like like look, it was, I'm sorry, and maybe I sh- maybe I don't know if this is like PC to say, but like oh god, no, but I'm saying like gay directors have been really creating <laughs> like some of the steamiest heterosexual <laughs> rom- like sexual tensions ever. <laughs> For decades they've been doing this. And Joel Schumacher is no exception. Because the amount, like, how sexy this is. Like, like, Nicole Kidman comes, I read the thing, so she, like, she yeah. tells him to be at her place at midnight. Yes! To have sex. Of course. But she answers the thing and she just dresses, she was actually naked. She was she, not wearing no, anything under naked. the thing. Yeah, I read the tri- in the trivia. Yeah, you um, can tell. She's and naked. it's like this banter between them, the sexual thing you could cut with them. Nice. Bro, they just like started making out. Yeah. And then she was like, oh, actually, I, I like someone else. That was yeah. so funny. <laughs> it's. But also, I'm going to be honest, I I didn't really like that dynamic. I thought it was kind of weird. Was oh, it-, it was not. It was not good chemistry on like an actual artistic level. Which is strange because I like. It was just I two really hot like people Andrea. being. Yeah, but I just, I don't know. I just thought it was like really forced. Like, well, with Andrea in Mask of the Phantasm, like they There's did a lot of there. work. You know. A, the voice performances are great. Yeah. Number one. But then number two, they do a lot of c- good character work. Mm-hmm. Whereas here, Nicole Kidman's character, like I didn't, again, because I'd never seen it, I didn't know much about it. I, I thought she was like Poison Ivy or something. Like, I thought she was going to be like a character we knew. Yeah. Um, she does not really have much development. She really is there as like, okay, we've done Vicky Vale, we've done Catwoman. Is she even a, a person? I like, believe she was created just for the film. Oh, okay, because I had never heard someone named Chase. From, no, from the I believe Batman. I believe she is unique to this film. Um, mm-hmm. and she is she is really there just to be like a love interest for the just dude, just to be hot, just to be like a hot. <laughs> but it's like. It's like, but you know what? The Joel Schumacher got the assignment and he turned it in early yeah. and answered the bonus questions <laughs> on the homework, right? You know what I mean? Like, yeah. like he really, like, it was like, okay, look, on an like artistic level and script level, this is pretty thin, but yeah. we're going to make it as, like, you know, as as uh, sexy as we can. Yeah. Um, and, and I don't think she was bad. I think it was just, it, it was just so strong that it was like, like, oh my God, like, like she was just like throwing herself at him, and it was like look within the first two <laughs> minutes. I was in this movie. Like, structure. Why? Just because he's like a masked vigilante? Like she was like, oh, I just like always go after the bad boys, but like I guess he's so. not a bad boy. He he like works, he works with, with the, the cops. Yeah, exactly. What are you, what are you saying? Just because he has a mask he's like on? Black. Yeah. I guess. Also, that was so weird. Did she think they were gonna have sex in his suit? She I was gonna know. find out his identity. I was gonna say it would be funny if he was like, <laughs> here's this blindfold. <laughs> I only have sex. It, I just thought it was a strange. Yeah. Uh, fun relationship. fact: This is the first. She's the first actress slash character to kiss Batman when he's dressed as Batman. Yeah. In all the other films, mm-hmm. if anyone kisses him, it's, he's Bruce. And then, and then that inspired Sam. Oh, uh, Spider Man and and. Uh, I'm just the, kidding. I don't know, uh, but no, maybe. I don't think so. But um, we could say so. It's interesting because when they're kissing, you know. Her tongue is in his cheek because the film is very tongue in cheek. 
<laughs> that that was that was a sloppy kiss. That was that was in it. Yeah. That was not you... like the little like um like kind of Disney movie princess kisses these were, these where it's were just like oh, did, like did mouth like, open. Did you like my segue? Yeah, yeah. Y- yeah, yeah. It's, it's pretty corny. But, you know, that's who we are, so um but yeah, no, it's really it's just really tongue in cheek. And like I said, it's more stylized and cartoony than the other ones were. Um and like you know, like like take we were talking about this before, but take Tommy Lee Jones, for example, the makeup, right? Like yeah. you contrast it with the Dark Knight one where it's like, what would this be like in real life? Yeah. Whereas this, it's like not only is he burned with like acid, mm-hmm. it's like he's purple now. Yeah, it's like made like kind of like silly, like he's like it's very Monstrous. exaggerated. Yeah, it's very, very exaggerated. Also, LOL, the, uh, I don't know the exact story, but I think in the, the Harvey Dent, or the Harvey Dent, in the Christopher Nolan one, isn't it from like a pipe? Like, no, so what happens is, is that he gets covered in, in gasoline on one side. Oh, And then oh, there's oh. an explosion, so that side of his whole body gets burned. It's not acid. Okay. Okay, well, it, it was kind of silly, like, the, the explanation. Like, he just covered his face with, like, a folder, and that's why it's, like, only on the one side. In what? The Dark Knight? In this movie. Oh, oh like, his like backstory, some, they showed that. Someone, the, someone threw acid. Like, the mob guy. I don't yeah. understand. I, I got, kind of got lost in that explanation. I guess he somehow blames Batman for it, but I forget why he blames Batman for this, even though it was the mob guy who did it. Uh, I think... I don't know. I got confused too, but maybe because he caught him and he was there. It was like you're the reason he was on trial. I was like, yeah, you you were trying him though. <laughs> anyway, um, I but, guess if they never tried him, he wouldn't have thrown the acid. But that's kind of a big workaround, though. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. It's like, it's just whatever. Um, but ebbs. But uh, something interesting I noticed, like again going back to Kilmer, Kilmer versus Keaton. <laughs> right, it's interesting because Kilmer is like very vanilla, mm-hmm. but the surrounding film is so much wackier than previous films. Yeah, so it makes his kind of like more low key performance more noticeable. And yeah. if anything, it would be like I feel like Keaton would have done better in this. Maybe, but maybe you yeah. need Bruce to be like the straight man, and everyone else is wacky. But like, it's like it it, it's weird. funny, like it's how it's like it almost should be flipped. Yeah, it's like, the, the juxtaposition was really weird. Like, I thought it kind of brought down the movie and sometimes, like, because it was so, like, out there. I don't know. And, like, so, something I also noticed was that, like, they kind of changed Gotham. Like, it was more like, like a Chinatown type situation. So it was, like, more, like, neon light. Like, this this movie was so 90s. Like, there was, like, the neon lights, like, um in like the just like in general but then there was like that gang of like like the um what are they called like glow stick gang (laughs) yeah they had like lightsabers and then and then they were like it was like it was like dark light a black light yeah it was like black light and they all had like the glow like they were going to a fucking rave or something yeah and then there was like um then there were like the people doing the drums and they looked like the the people in the masks in Scooby Doo Spooky Island. Yes, it's and, it's not called Scooby Doo on Spooky Island. It's just called Scooby Doo. Well, you know what? It's not called Batman eighty nine either. But that's Ooh. how you know it um, because there's literally like a million Scooby Doo's. Yeah. So yeah, that was kind of funny. It reminded me of that. And like uh, Robin's like, is it a haircut? His sideburns, like sure, yeah. His whole look. Like kind very of very sharp. Yeah, it, it was looked, very nice. It looked like someone from like from that movie. Yeah, and then like the the kind of glow in the dark, like the, the drums and all that. Yeah. I, I could be totally wrong. I could be misremembering. But if I in my research or my trivia, looking up situation it gives me big boss baby um, vibes. It, it gives me big huge boss baby. No, vibes. just kidding. Yeah. It gives me big Scooby Doo vibes. Yeah, <laughs> it's like you. Everything's compared to Scooby Doo or Back to the Future. <laughs> or like that's like everything. Um, no, but um, I believe Cho- like Tokyo was maybe a reference for this. Um, yeah, it's not so much like Chinatown, but just like even if it wasn't neon or lights, Tokyo where it was like or something. If like it was city lights, like you know, but shining saw, on a I statue, a like it's gonna be blue or green, like it's gonna no, be it a was color. Red. I saw. I saw like Chinese. Sure. I just mean any color. I'm yeah, just saying a yeah. color. Like 
like in the Tim Burton one, it would have been like shades of gray. Yeah. And then like yes, if yes. there was like a, a light shining on something, so it would much be brighter, it'd yeah. be it'd be just like a standard like kind of neutral color. So Whereas much with brighter. this, it's like it's gonna be very intentional. Like this is not gonna be realistic. Like we're gonna yeah. make a choice. Both the colors, like color palette, and then also yeah. like the the form, like we we're saying with yeah. the glow and the like the glow but sticks and stuff like that. That again, that's like my favorite or part neon. of the movie. I think is like the color palette, just like how. You know, it's a choice. Mm -hmm. You can debate if it's a good choice or not, but mm -hmm. I don't think you can say this movie is like mediocre, one way or the other. I think it's either good or bad. You know, I don't think you could say it's kind of like lazy. In any no, case, not you know lazy. I mean? No. Um, but the, the film just is filled with like these ridiculous lines <laughs> and acting choices. It's yeah. like, like even even for me, like I'm talking about how much I love like the silliness and how extra it is. Sometimes there's like like. So, so the the whole subplot with uh, with the Riddler, right? Yeah. He starts off in Wayne Enterprises like R and D department, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? Why is his manager so extra? He's like, <laughs> he's like, I told him we canceled that this morning. <laughs> Like he's so Hello. over there. It's like it's like why are you making these acting choices? He, like why are you doing he's that? He's trying to match Jim Carrey. Um. I guess so, but I don't know. It just feels kind of strange. Well, he's just like a he's just like a neurotic like uptight guy who's trying to impress the CEO. I don't know. It just feels kind of funny. Um, yeah. It's just funny, dude. I also thought, like, maybe it's because there's, like, kind of the three people, like, three kind of situations happening, but some of the stuff just kind of, like, I was, like, kind of confused about, like, like, it didn't make, like, why is he all of a sudden, like, trying to prove, like, Bruce specifically wrong? Like, them. Well, I guess because he pitched in the idea and he was like, no. No, I know, but, like, couldn't that just be with anyone? Like, couldn't that... I mean, I know he killed his manager, but, like, couldn't that just be like, oh, I'm going to show them... I'm going to show them... I think he... It's there's like, two reasons. It's like a specific thing. There's two Bruce. reasons. Number one, because Bruce is the one who said no. <laughs> and two, it's a Batman film. This so he has, to, he has to hate true. Batman. That, that's why. Those also, are the two reasons. something that I noticed... He was, he was like, regular, right, in one scene. Then the next scene, he was Riddler. Pink hair. Then the next scene, he was he was regular again. But he keep dyeing his hair back and forth. Well, there's one part where he intentionally looks like Val Kilmer. On purpose. Yes, no, that was... Like, yeah. style his hair. I think they even gave him a fake mole. Yes, Because Val Kilmer has mole. that mole on his on his neck. Or, like, his, his jawline. Yeah. Um, something I noticed about this one, there's a lot more CGI. Um, and by a lot yes. more, I mean, I don't think the previous two live action films had any CGI, really. Um, yeah. well, whereas this one, there's, there's, there's a lot more, more computer-generated imagery. Yeah, like like blowing up and, and you know, cars going yeah. on buildings. So, yeah. yeah. I think there's some landscape. Um, landscape's not the right word. But like the urban landscape, like some buildings, I think, were CGI Skyline. at some parts. Yeah. Um, what'd you say? Skyline? Yeah, yeah. But I, I, I've, I'm... Maybe I'm just confusing this with Mask of the Phantasm, but isn't there a sequence where we're like kind of like moving through the city? Like I think it's like an opening scene, and it was clearly CGI. Like you were going to, because it looked like a PS One video game. Like maybe I don't remember that, but if it was, it wasn't that long. It's like um, I think that was with the Phantasm. But um, I will say for his bland performance, Kilmer's very handsome. He's pretty handsome. He is very. He is very. He's probably the sexiest, except for maybe, <laughs> except for maybe Adam West. He's probably the sexiest. Adam West is pretty, pretty um, attractive. Yeah. But but Adam West is like sexy in the way where it's like, I'm like a 20 year old actress starting off in the business, and I'm gonna sleep with this 50 year old guy who's still like amazingly attractive. What? <laughs> I know that was very specific. Whereas Val Kilmer is like young people hot. Adam West is old people hot. O old. <laughs> you know, he, was, he probably wasn't even that old. I guess actually. so. I wonder how old he was. Maybe he wasn't even that old. He just looks like an oh. older hot person. Like, you know how George Clooney well, that's, was hot, that's what I but he's saying. still hot, but, like, in a different way? Yeah. That's right, what I'm yes. saying. Where it's like, and speaking of George Clooney, like he, he's Jennifer, Batman uh, in the next one. Val Kilmer does not return. Aniston. Oh. Oh, yeah, you said that. Val was only in the one. Yeah. I guess I didn't like him. Well, well I, I think know. Joel Schumacher was like, I don't want to work with him again. Oh, that's right, because he was... They were had some issues difficult. on set. What yeah. was it? What What is he being difficult about? He was just rude, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. Well, to people and, and to him and being like a like a like an actor, he was just being an actor. Sometimes people they get grumpy. I don't know. No, just kidding. I'm not gonna. <laughs> <laughs> um. Um. Yeah. It was kind of weird that Bruce was like blonde, but like our first blonde Bruce. It was like yeah. a dirty blonde. A dirty blonde. Yeah. Oh, you. I'm the know. only blonde Bruce. No. Yeah. 
Uh, I don't know. I think so. I yeah. think so. Yeah. I thought he was all right. He 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 looked he looked good in the turtleneck and the little glasses and whatnot. Did they give him little glasses? Well, they were bigger though. They weren't little. Well, I mean, they the little the little glasses that he sometimes puts on, never reads with, and then takes them off shortly yes. after. They're they're just for the look. Like, yeah. Look! Look just, at these. They're just. They're just. They're just clear glasses. There, there's no prescription. He doesn't wear them while he's Batman. Does he have oh. contact lenses? Are they just for reading? But, he never reads. <laughs> but this is. Is this the best Jim Carrey performance? No. Is it the most Jim Carrey performance? Yes. Oh my god. I think this. I think he's outdone himself. I thought I'd seen the most ridiculous Jim Carrey ever. <laughs> this. This. I think. Ups, I think this takes the cake. I think this is the yeah. most ridiculous um his physicality the costumes Mm -hmm. it's just it's just out of this world it's just it's outrageously he keeps changing he keeps changing he's got so many outfits i didn't realize he was a fashion man (laughs) yeah i didn't understand i think he just had the one the green outfit with the the question marks but i guess he gets but i but i guess that's he took that from that little fortune teller type thing like which was maybe sentient? Also, yeah, was that <laughs> sentient? And also, why did he have that? I think because what? they thought it would be funny. That's why. <laughs> you. This is a movie... This is what I'm saying. This is... I'm confused. I told the story about Harrison Ford telling Luke Skywalker not to care it's, about politics. It's not if, kind if of this movie. ever rep, If that quote ever applied to anything, it would be this movie. It's not that kind of movie. I if know. people are worried about that, we're in big trouble. It's just the fact that... I know it's not that kind of movie, but the fact that it's there raises questions. Um, Let's talk about Robin. Okay. Because, again, I think... This the is grown man. The grown man pretending, pretending to be like a teenage be, boy. Like 17 years old. Um, well, let's think, because we talked about this with the other ones where Robin's been in it. <laughs> or no, is that not like 17. Robin? He, college. They say college. So he's older. I don't know why he would need a guardian if he's in college, though. I don't think, I think he's like, I think he's going into, he's like a teenager. Like, he's going to be in college. Okay. He says um, college kid. Um, but we've talked about this where it's like, these movies kind of like, sometimes do Robin sometimes they don't use Robin yeah and it's like interesting to see how they do it because it's like there's no there's no great way to do it where it's not weird mm-hmm. and silly um and I don't know if it makes it better or worse that he's like a grown man um but he's been a grown man in the other ones but like with Burt War- with with the Adam West like one with Burt Ward like an obviously War- grown man not like a like a baby faced person like Selena he's the Gomez first one that looks like-, like he could beat me up <laughs> yeah. Whereas like the other one, so let's look at the other Robins. The first serial film that was a literal boy. Yeah. The second one, he was a scrawny dude. Mm-hmm. In the Adam West one, it was Burt Ward, who was a grown man, but he was very short and scrawny. Mm-hmm. Chris O'Donnell's like a a tall, like <laughs> wide framed. Well, man. how how old was he? Like. Like twenty five. Okay. This was the era where That's it was like you would too watch. Bad. This was the era. Where, I mean, not the era. Like, this has basically been, I think, forever until recently. But, mm-hmm. like, you know, you're playing 17 years old, but you're, like, 25 or 30 years old. You know yeah, I mean? yeah. Like, if you look at Smallville, Tom Welling, who played Clark. Yeah. The first year was supposed to be 14. He was 24. He was not 14. He was 24 years old. He did not look 14 at all. No one did. Everyone was older. Yeah. That was what you did. At, at least with, like, something like 13 Reasons Why, like, they, they looked... They like you could kind of believe it, even though like not like some of them are older, you know. They they would their characters were meant to be like sixteen or seventeen, and they were like twenty two. Yeah, or someone like. Whereas Tom Welling was was twenty four. He was ten years older than his character. No, he did not look like a. I don't care. I don't care. I've never seen a fourteen year old look like that. Tall, sure, maybe. Well, well, it makes sense because he was not fourteen. So. No, I know. I'm just saying. So he does not. <laughs> but when you're a kid, but like with, you're like, I guess that's what teenagers look like. No, I know, right? <laughs> um, or or you could have something crazy like Ralph Macchio, and like I think he, he was like. He was like the reverse. I, I think he was like like thirty years old when he did Karate Kid, right? He was like something, maybe not thirty, but like he was like twenty something. Yeah. And he he was playing like a fifteen year old. Yeah. Well. Yeah. So there there's some people who are just like that, you know? Yeah. Can just but forever. but I think they do. I think they at least on paper this Robin is like I think Robin works best when he's like kind of a shithead, mm-hmm. like where he's kind of like an ass, where he's like kind of like like a little tougher and like I guess so. I think that works better. Is he supposed to be? I thought, some, I, some versions I thought of him. he was supposed to be silly. It's like, huh. hey, Batman. That's that's the that cultural just... conception yeah. from the Adam West <laughs> one, right? You know, um, I think 
I think he works best as a character when he's kind of like a little edgier. Mm-hmm. And, and Batman's there to kind of like keep him from going off the deep end in yeah. a way. Um, so we do kind of get that here. Um, that we get his origin. Yeah. Um, oh, that was so sad. I don't know why, because it's like a very. I don't very, know why you. It's like a very like. Kind I don't know of why it was so emotionally generic, affected. Generic like kind of thing to happen or whatever, but like, oh my gosh, I I actually cried like during that. Like, I know. I was that very was surprised. so sad because because his mom was like, oh, be careful, and like they're a tight fit, fa- like tight knit family, and they're doing like their little acrobat, whatever. Yeah. He saves the town. He saves the tent. Comes back. The all three dead. dead. And you know what? And Bruce was like, oh, we're the same. No, he also lost a brother. He's mourning three people. You're only mourning two. And okay. also, his are really fresh. So, That's you true, know. Yeah. And also, ugh, ugh. also, you have Alfred, <laughs> who is the same Alfred from the last movies, which I think he's really cute. He's a cute little old man. And, yeah. And I think he, he gets more opportunity to shine in this one. He's a good Alfred, yeah. Because, because, um, this version of Bruce, both the Keaton and the Kilmer, like, is already Batman. Mm-hmm. We don't get to kind of see Alfred kind of be, like, a mentor figure for him as much. Mm-hmm. Like, he's kind of, like, this already fully formed Batman. Yeah, Whereas with this, because good. Robin's kind of going through his origin, Alfred kind of gets to be a mentor for him. Mm-hmm. So Alfred not only just gets more scenes. Yeah. Like, but he gets that opportunity to shine and kind of have, like, these these kind of touching moments with Robin and kind of encouraging him. And, yeah. Um... I also thought it was interesting that, like, um, I I always thought it was that, like, I, I figured because he was his ward or whatever that, like, Bruce brought Robin into what he's doing, right? But, like, this was more like Robin's kind of, like, forcing himself into it. Like, like Batman is, a, or Bruce is against the idea of him becoming something like Batman, whereas, he, whereas he's, like... You know, I want to be your sidekick. I thought that was interesting. Yeah, I don't know if that's from I don't know the if comics. that's true. Yeah, but I just, I don't know. Well, because I, it's at the very least, Bruce encourages him to be his ward. Like, to take care of him. Yeah, no, I, I, figure, I figure because of that, he's like, oh, like, I get to have this little buddy, you know, like, like mm-hmm. people who are like, oh, like, I want to, you know, put my, sure, my yeah. little girl in pageants or whatever, you know. Um, kind of yeah. like a, like a, a, a toy, a child yeah. to play with or whatever. Um, <laughs> in, in a non weird way. And, um, but I thought it was interesting. No. He wanted, and also Alfred without telling Bruce, like introduced him to the whole thing. He yeah. just let him into the bad cave. No, he didn't let him in. Robin snuck in. Well, yeah, but he knew what he was doing. I don't think so. He, come on. He saw him up there. He walked in the door. Yeah, that's funny. The acrobatics are really his funny. His little like, acrobat ass is going to be flipping around. He jumps down like three stories and climbs. You stuff know, up. you know, he's but, like he's a hard-headed dude. He he's going to try to figure out what's in that room that's locked. It's like mm-hmm. Belle, you know. Why why can't I go in the West Wing or the East Wing or whatever? Which whatever one she can't go into. Mm. So she goes into. Um, he but does. this is a very noble Batman in this one. When he's you know what I mean. Yes. You know, there's a few examples I wrote down. Kill. Um, yeah, but, but I mean, in terms of just like being like a nice dude. So like for, here's a few examples. So, so oh. the opening thing with like the Riddler, he, he kills the, the, like his manager or whatever. Yeah. But he makes it seem like it was a suicide. Yeah. So, so Bruce is like, I want to make sure that family. his family gets all the benefit. <laughs> oh yeah, the family. No, yeah, I thought that was really sweet. And, and the woman who like his assistant's like, oh, like suicide isn't covered under our insurance policy. He's like, I know, give give him the full benefits. We'll pay for the benefits. Anyway. Yeah, I thought that um, was sweet. At the circus, um, you know, Two Face has this bomb, and he's like, I'll do, I'll. The only way to stop this is if Batman reveals himself, whatever. And and without think, without hesitating. Bruce shouts, I'm Batman, but there's so much pandemonium no one can hear him. Yeah. And it's funny because Dick kind of calls him out on it later mm-hmm. where it's like, you know, you could have stopped this by turning yourself in. Mm-hmm. And he's like, I tried. Yeah. You know. Also, uh, how did Chase not hear that? She was right next to him. Yeah, I know. Um, <laughs> but, and then also like when Dick really doesn't want to stay with him and he kind of like gets him to stay and he's like, oh, you know, I have all this stuff and you know, maybe you could keep, like he kind of like 
Yeah. He's he's doing it. He's not because he really needs help. He doesn't really give a shit about fixing these bikes. It's it's to get no, him yeah. to stay, right? Yeah. So, him and Alfred both do that. So, I will say even if his performance is kind of like muted, I do like that screenplay element. Mm-hmm. The, in terms of the writing, like they kind of give Bruce like a heart of gold, right? Where I yeah. feel like the other ones like didn't really do much in way of that like him being like a really good guy I don't know like not that he was a bad guy besides like saving people yeah but I'm saying just like I was like like interpersonal things yeah um but something else again that I think was more interesting in this than the Tim Burton ones in terms of Batman is that um we really get to see him wrestle with his guilt over his parents death and like that trauma like it was his Um, fault or something and from my understanding there's there was a much longer version of this film um, mm-hmm. And not even longer, but there was a lot of deleted scenes that really delved more into the, like, his psycho- oh, really? the psychology. But the studio mm-hmm. wanted it lighter, more goofy. Mm-hmm. Like, they wanted it to, again, for average. Because it seems like, again, they lost a lot of money because, uh, in terms of merchandising for the last one. Because it was darker. And, cer- and like, I don't know. I think McDonald's it's... pulled the Happy Meal deal because it was, like, too dark. And they were like, we don't want to be associated with it. It's kind of dark. Yeah. A little too scary for kids. And, I don't know. Um, so, so apparently, so there was even more of this, is my point. This yeah. this idea of, like, this guilt and, like, him, the idea of the bat and the fear and, yeah. like, you know. Um, so that's kind of interesting. And I guess that does, that is, like, the one thing that kind of makes Chase's character worth it is that she's, like, a psychologist. So it kind of, mm-hmm. like, is, like, an excuse to then explore yeah. his his trauma and his repressed memories mm. and all this stuff, right? Um, she's not a very, she's not a very nice psychologist calling people wackos. <laughs> and then they make a joke of it. It's like, oh, is that a technical term? It's like, yeah. it's very stigmatizing language. <laughs> it is stigmatizing. It would not work in well, 2023. Well, I mean, it is, it is the 90s, so, you know, people, but, yeah, yeah but um, not everyone with DID has, uh, she said homicidal, but homicidal tendencies. Yeah, why'd you say homicidal? Homicidal. That that had to have been intentional. I don't know. I because don't this know. is a very gay movie. <laughs> homicidal. Why would you um, want that to be associated? Why is Drew Barrymore in this? I don't know. She, she she's in everything. She's that's like, why. but she's like a bit. Pl- so from my understanding, she she was really troubled, right? So she was a child oh, star. She- yeah. Oh, she had a huge drug problem, like. Oh. Like, like, kind of like her eras, like Lindsay Lohan mm-hmm. or Britney Spears or, wh- or what have you. Like, mm-hmm. really, like, just had some troubles. Um, well, she really flashed David Letterman on his show oh. <laughs> away from the camera, but she she climbed yeah. up on his on his desk and like lifted oh, her top and her, <laughs> like see. So I, I don't know at what period of this, but my point is that like you know, it's weird that she's just like a random side character in this movie yeah. as like a bit, like basically like a henchman for the henchman. I just right. figure, like, in the 80s and 90s, it's not weird to see Drew Barrymore in a movie, like, even in a side role, just because, like, she was doing so much, and, like, I mean, like, E.T. and, like, other stuff. Like, she was just... But like, I don't think... I don't know if she was in a bunch of stuff. I don't know. I feel like she was in a bunch of stuff. Maybe not. I think you're thinking later when she kind of, like, Maybe got back on track like the, in, like, the 90s. Like, in this period, like, in the... Like, so I'm, I think, like, with, like, the... I don't know much about her career, but, like, The Wedding Singer was, like, 98. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was like you know maybe so I don't know. Um, those it, are those are. Um, it doesn't seem that weird for a '90s movie, but I don't know. It was just funny that she's just like this big because yeah. the other woman is not famous. Yeah, that's yeah. my point. Is it does, is, it does is, is just funny. weird? Yeah. Um, that's all my thoughts though on the movie. Yeah. Um, do you want to do some trivia? Sure. Okay. Um, sorry if I seem a little muted. Um, I I gotta talk to my psychiatrist. I I take I'm on Ritalin. For my ADHD. You're really spilling it, all your beans. It, oh, I don't care. I'm, we're destigmatizing it. I don't care. I have ADHD. I don't know. If you can probably tell from the tangents we take. Um, <laughs> but I take it. And I feel really good for like an hour. Yeah. And then I start to feel irritable and tired and and, and like edgy. Mm. On edge. Um, exactly. So I don't know. I'm like, why does it only work for an hour? Like, I feel really good. Like, during this opening, I was like, I feel really good. Mm-hmm. And then now I'm like... I'm grumpy now for some reason. So, mm. sort of, I feel a little more muted the second half of this. So, mm. so I do I do a really good job at masking, which probably isn't healthy. But, <laughs> but so, um, oh my good lord! Should we do some trivia? Yes. Okay. Val Kilmer and Jim Carrey became good friends during filming. They bonded over the deaths of their fathers. Oh. 
I guess they both. I guess their fathers both died. You know, during filming. Prematurely. No, I don't. Oh, I don't know if they died during filming. Or just in general, it still sucks to lose. They just died before their time. It wasn't like they were like seventy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Jim Carrey's original idea to shave a question mark into his scalp had to be scratched as he was due in court to finalize his divorce. (laughs) It did look like he was gonna be bald before he took his hat off. Um, because like the sides were bald. Yeah, Yeah, and I I was not a fan. I was I was like kind of ticked off. But then I saw he had you know, then he took his hat off, he had pink hair. I was like, okay, but Mm -hmm. I don't know. I was like, I really don't want to see Jim Carrey bald. I don't know. (laughs) I don't know, it just doesn't look right. Yeah, it would that would be kind of strange. Maybe because I'm thinking of the boy. Oh, who's that boy? The scary boy. Who's that boy? Well, the scary man who lives in Brooklyn, the Riddler now. Paul Dano. Paul Dano, yes, because he has hair, and I think I was thinking of him. Mm. And I don't know, I just thought it would be weird if he was just randomly bald, and the characters not known for being bald. I don't know. Anywho, that's great. Okay. <laughs> That's great, Carl. While t- while Tim Burton was still slated to direct the film, Mickey Dolenz was considered to play the Riddler. I have no idea who that is. Uh, I think he was part of the know. Monkees. The band, the Monkees. Oh! Um, but after Burton dropped out, Robin Williams was offered the role by Warner Brothers. Oh! But if you remember, he really lobbied hard to play the Joker in the first one. Yes. If it went to Jack Nicholson. Yes, and he yes, was, yes. But So he refused to play the Riddler in this because he was still bitter about being used <laughs> as bait. I think they kind of then, like, linked it to the press that they were going to maybe go with Robin Williams. Yeah. To then, like, kind of, in negotiating tactics, get oh, Jack yeah. Nicholson to do yeah. it. So he was like, you used me as bait to lure Jack. I'm not going to play. I'm not going to do your thing. So. That would have been a good one. Good, but, for, good for you, Robin. Sticking up yeah. for yourself. Um, the Batmobile was usually driven by stunt drivers, but Chris O'Donnell insisted on driving it himself in the joyride scene. <laughs> um, he crashed it into a curb and dented a fender. I can't believe they did that. I, well, maybe it wasn't real, but I can't believe they blew up the car. It's like the Bat. It's like I the know. Batmobile. I can't it's believe like, those villains did that. It's like no, I know, but usually he, they're like shooting, and it's like ha ha ha, it's impenetrable. Well, I, then, I don't think it's impenetrable for TNT. Nope. Um, Joel Schumacher, I think I talked about this a little. Joel Schumacher originally wanted to make a much darker, more serious film that would have that would have more fully explored Bruce Wayne's growing fear that his crusade to be Batman had done more harm than good, and that Bruce was beginning to suffer from burnout. But the executives at Warner mm. Brothers insisted on a lighter tone. Um, That'd be so interesting. there's there's this whole. Have you heard of the like the the Snyder cut? All of this drama. Oh, of the of the the modern ones. So the super. Batman so, one. so, so in terms of like the modern DC films, the the first few were directed by Zack Snyder, yeah, who directed like Three Hundred, Watchmen, uh, Dawn of the Dead, like the remake of Dawn of the Dead, mm-hmm. um, which we watch when they're in the mall, mm-hmm. um, and he had when they were making Justice League, they had to he had to drop out due to he he had to drop out because unfortunately his his daughter died, um, oh, no. she committed suicide. So he was just so wrapped up emotionally that he dropped out yeah. of, of making Justice League. Now, for context, yeah. the two previous films in this franchise, Man of Steel, which is like the Superman movie, yeah. and then Batman v Superman, colon, Dawn of Justice, yes. were not really... They were very divisive. Some people loved them, some people hated them. Yeah. So he leaves Justice League, mm-hmm. and they bring on Joss Whedon, who directed The Avengers, mm-hmm. to, to direct okay. Justice League. And that was universally disliked. Oh, and really? people, yeah, it was just people didn't really like it. Right. Even anyway, though, some years go by, the Avengers? and people, it basically, it, it comes out that like you know, there's probably enough footage for Zack Snyder to like release his version. Nah. Oh wait, so, I so think this so the, this huge versions, online right? campaign begins. Hashtag release the Snyder cut. <laughs> release the Snyder cut. This was the first time that they bullied Warner Brothers <laughs> for years <laughs> to finally let Zack Snyder, like, give him the money to to finish it, like, do the post-production, maybe film some extra scenes. Yeah. And basically say, do whatever you want. Power to This is people. for you. So they released it on HBO Max. It was, like, one of the first things when that service launched. Mm-hmm. Or, or, like, one of the first big things. It's, like, four hours long. Yeah, I thought that's what the Schneider Cut is, just, like, a longer one. It is. It's the side, but it's long, but it has different. Because Joss Whedon, I believe, Joss Whedon reshot a lot of stuff, rewrote a lot of stuff. Mm. Um, 
Whereas this was a lot more like a Zack whole, Snyder style, thing. right? It's a whole different thing, yeah. So now it's like become like, I feel like a meme, like to say release the blank cut. Mm. It's actually starting to become a thing, release the Schumacher cut. That 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 some the, the writer of this movie said that there is a cut, a full cut of that original version with all those deleted scenes that's much longer. Hmm. All that they would need to do is like just do like the post production part of it. Like mm-hmm. cleaning some sound up and whatever. Like mm-hmm. like you could really you could do it and release it. Why would they do that if they were told not to? Why would they No, they made a first cut and then Warner Brothers was like, take this out, take that out, take that oh, out. Oh, oh. So, so the presume theoretically, the material is there to release a four-hour version uh, of this movie. Um, four hours. I don't know if we'll ever see it, but my point being is that that does uh, that is a thing, right? Um, I'd watch. All, all this point to be is that Warner Brothers really like pushed for a lighter tone, so any of that stuff that was a little bit more psychologically interesting or maybe thematically darker mm-hmm. uh, was axed. It's a little. There's still a little bit here, but it's 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 neutered quite. No, yeah, Significantly. It's, it's very, yeah. Um, when learning to twirl a cane, Jim Carrey reportedly broke around a dozen prop canes and some of his trailer furniture. Um, the bat suit was so heavy that Val Kilmer lost five pounds filming the opening fight scene alone. What? <laughs> That's crazy. I always wonder, it's like, those are probably really immobile. You know? Yeah. I heard, I heard the, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles were really heavy, too. Oh, yeah. Are you kidding? Oh, my God. That's even worse because it's, like, thick prosthetic and it has, like, yeah. stuff in the head for the, the, the animatronic stuff. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Right? For the mouths moving and stuff. But I think we're controlled by, like, the, little radio controls. Oh, do you, wonder, do you wonder if the shells were hollow or not? I don't know. Probably. I don't know why they would. I don't know why they would make them not hollow. Well, you have to... They can't be just filled with air they have to have a hard surface well they could be hard but they can still be hollow yeah I don't know anyway um, Bruce Tim, the writer and producer of the animated series said in an interview quote I did not enjoy Shum- Joel Schumacher's Batman at all <laughs> oh. uh, Batman co-creator Bob Kane said in a Cinescape interview that Val Kilmer had given the best inter- interpretation among all the actors to play Batman up to that time that's what I've been saying. So a good, a good endorsement from the co-creator Bob Kane. Yes. Um, I wonder how Bill Finger felt about um, about that. Bill. Uh, Tim Burton said, "Quote: I always hated those titles like Batman Forever. That sounds like a tattoo that somebody <laughs> would get when they're on drugs or something, or something some kid would write in the yearbook to somebody else. I have high problems with some of those titles." <laughs> it is rumored that Burton was considering the title Batman Continues while he was still slated to direct. <laughs> They are kind of funny. That's like, Batman so Return, true. Batman Forever. That's so true. But the next one is weird. Like, maybe it makes sense when you watch it. Like, it's really, like, a, a buddy movie. But, like, why is the next one just called Batman and Robin? I don't know. Like, all the things are, like, nouns or verbs or adjectives. Oh why is it just, like, Batman and Robin? It's like, here's who's in the movie. I never thought of that, but that's so funny. Hags, Batman Forever. Like, yeah. Like, just, like, a little boy writing to his friend in yeah. the yearbook. Batman Forever. Uh, <laughs> Joel Schumacher's decision to put nipples and enlarged cod pieces on the bat costumes, as well as an earring on Robin, caused cod, controversy. What is a cod piece? Like a the dick? bulge. Oh, the like bulge. The bulge, yeah, cod piece. Um, it even cod pieces. I think you wear like in sports to to protect your. No, that's a cup. I think another word is a cod piece. Oh. Um, <laughs> I didn't know pieces even, were fish. I yeah. Cods. It, it um. But the, doing this, as well as um, giving Robin, like, an earring, mm-hmm. uh, caused controversy. It even bothered Batman creator Bob King. Schumacher said he wanted the costumes to have an anatomic look. Um, so, they, you know, you could see, like, the abs are part yeah, of the costume. Yeah, yeah. And the, nip- the nipples, I guess. That's the thing. That um, that. While the earring was supposed to make Robin look more <laughs> hip, he also claimed that the basis for Batman the, for the Batman and Robin suits came from the statues of the gods of ancient Greece, which is kind of interesting. Yeah. Right, which oh do have, gosh. like, the nipples. and oh But those have small God. penises, Joel. <laughs> well, you said, well, if you have the opportunity, you know. Yeah. Um, no, I thought that was really cool, though. They they made that, or they made Robin, um, like, a really cool outfit. Like, it, it fit. Because he starts with the kind of, like, a goofy, like, the one, like, the classic Robin. But then he yeah. gets, like, a sleek 90s, like, shiny version. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know why it was shiny, but like it. Fit, Just the material. It's it not like a matte finish. More. It fits more like like a duo, you know. Yeah. Um. Because usually, like it's like such a bright colors, it just like 
he looks goofy. That's why I thought it wouldn't have fit like, that version. That, yeah, that's why I think it. What? That's why I. I thought it was weird when you were like, "Oh, it's best when he's an asshole," because like, he looks goofy. Why would he be an asshole? You know, like. This um, is more edgy. I don't mean like he's like an asshole. No, I know. I'm just saying. I'm just saying the two. The two. Mm-hmm. Uh, going against each other. Yeah. Uh, I forgot what I was. Oh yeah, the earring is very nineties. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a single ear. Right? Yeah, the single earring. Yeah. Um, Joel Schumacher wanted... We talked about this a little. Joel Schumacher wanted the design for Gotham City to have personality, with more statues and neon lights. He cited as an influence the 1940s and 50s Batman comics, 1930s New York City architecture, and modern Tokyo. Mm, Tokyo, yes. Uh, for the scene where Chase Marini is visited by, visited by Batman on her balcony at night, Nicole Kidman was not wearing any clothing underneath the white silk sheet with which she was covering herself. Oh my. So it's a good thing she didn't drop it. <laughs> Michael Jackson lobbied to play the Riddler, but he was turned down. What? Matthew Broderick also expressed interest in the role. Director Sh- Joel Schumacher <laughs> cast Jim Carrey because Schumacher and Warner Brothers felt that he was the perfect part following... He was perfect for the part following the success of Ace Ventura, colon, Pet Detective. Hey, guys. I got a riddle for you. Michael Jackson. <laughs> Dick Gray- <laughs> Dick Grayson is apparently meant to be a teenager. Perhaps 15, what? but no more than 18. Chris Donald was 25 during filming. No, he said college. Bruce said college, kid. Uh, in their first conversation, Batman explains to a clueless Chase Meridian that bats are not rodents, as she believed. He's actually referring to the taxonomy biological classification. Rodents are members of the order Rodentia, and their shared trait is, quote, a single pair of continuously growing incisors in each of the upper and lower jaws. Bats are members of the Chiroptera. Uh, They are members of the order Chiroptera, and their shared traits are wings and elongated digits. They are neither closely related in phylogeny nor particularly similar in morphology. That was in the trivia. So I thought you would. Well, I want to explain the difference between rats and, and bats. <laughs> I thought I thought she was just being sarcastic. Obviously, a, a bat is not a rat. Just because. No, but like a rodent. But they're not it's rodents. Not a rodent. Either. I know, but it's it's like, it's, it's, like it's a, not part of rodentia. It's part of chiroptia. Ch- like, chiroptera. It's like almost like a bird kind of thing. No, it's not part like of the a, bird. Like thing. a bird mammal type thing. No, it's its own thing. I don't know. Um, the Riddler dejectedly saying oh so I said this while we were watching and I felt very validated reading this trivia point the Riddler dejectedly saying you were supposed to understand after Bruce Wayne doesn't support his vision to market mind reading technology can feel more grim and poignant since the release of The Batman in 2022 with Robert Pattinson and Paul Dano mm-hmm. in the latter film that Riddler thinks that Batman supports his campaign of mass murder and terror yeah. and their exchange of opinions leaves both men emotionally shaken so I, I, I do the comparison too where the Riddler kind of is like but hurt because he was like, I thought you understood my vision, right? That's what I'm saying is that it wasn't it wasn't really built out, and I think that's why it was kind of strange. Mm-hmm. Like, not not that it was just Bruce, but I guess like the yeah. the way that it was Bruce. Also, you skipped Sam. I know we already talked about Sam. Oh, okay. Yeah, if you were listening, Sam. Of reading. Um, we talked about this in terms of the Schumacher cut. Uh, many scenes were removed from the final cut for pacing reasons. Mm-hmm. The Red Diary subplot was extended. Remember like, this idea of like to- his father's Red yeah. Diary. It's like. And then he wrote in every day. And then I realized he would never write in it again. That was kind of random. Um, well, but I guess there was more to it. Yeah, there was more, yeah. Um, and the, this subplot was extended with Bruce having guilt over his parents' death since he insisted on going to the theater on that fatal night. Uh, this is hinted in the theatrical cu- cut from his repressed memories in the line of Alf- Bruce to Alfred, I killed them, referring to the death of the Flying Graysons. The Batcave actually had a hidden layer beneath the Batmobile floor, explaining how the Batwing and Batboat were saved from the climactic bombing. Um, <laughs> after Bruce wakes up from the shot, he had temporary amnesia. Alfred finally goads him into visiting the hidden portion of the Batcave. Bruce fi- finds the abandoned diary and reads the last entry more carefully. They'd actually gone to see Zorro, um, as in the comics, mm-hmm. upon his father's insistence, not his own. Um, so he realized mm-hmm. he, he, he kind of misremembered. He thought it was his, he insisted, but really it was his father's mm-hmm. decision to go see this movie. Yeah. Um, Bruce eventually realizes that he is not to blame for the tragic killings, and all of his memories of Batman finally resurface. This would lead more fluently to his final showdown with the Riddler and his assertion that he has consciously embraced both of his identities. Hmm. Again, more interesting. Yeah. Character stuff. Also, can we talk about how 
he knocked down a whole last door and then they just ignored oh, it. Oh yeah, apparently <laughs> Nicole, that, they, the reason why they added that is that Nicole Kidman <laughs> was into kickboxing. So she was like, can we integrate this somehow? Why? So, I don't know. She was just like, do I'm it, into it right do now. It, do it in your free time. I don't know. What? <laughs> so they had her doing it. Yeah, so if you haven't watched the movie, Bruce comes to see her in her office and she hears like grunting like as if she's like in a struggle. So he breaks down the door because it's locked. She just has like a, like a boxing, uh, what do they call those? Oh, uh, yeah. Like the thing the that bag. just hangs. The back to the, the, like the, the punching bag. She's just like kickboxing, practicing. But he knocks on the whole door and they never explain it. They never, uh, not explain it, they never address it. He just puts it back up. <laughs> now, and he, she's like, luckily, I'm glad if someone was going to do that, it's you because you could pay for it. And then, just, <laughs> then they have their conversation. It feels like they, they wrote a scene and then added that part in the beginning, but then didn't change the rest of the scene <laughs> to reflect that the man with his fucking shoulder busted down this door. Wouldn't, yeah, wouldn't that be like, oh, why are you doing that? You know, like, kind of, hey, you're acting like Batman. Also, why does she live at the museum or whatever? Does she? They're in the same place. Oh. Are you sure? I guess so. The same background, kind of, it's like that oh. tan, kind of, like, um, stone type thing and I don't know then. Do I hear some critical reception? Yes. It was received rather critically. I I'm looking at this Rotten Tomatoes and I. Yeah. So <laughs> it has a 39% on Rotten Tomatoes in terms of the reviews at the time. The critical consensus is quote loud, excessively busy, and often boring. I don't know if that's true. Batman Forever <laughs> nonetheless has the charisma of Jim Carrey and Tommy Lee Jones to offer mild relief. Uh, Peter Travers of Rolling Stone wrote, quote, Batman still gets in its licks. There's no fun machine this summer that packs more surprises. Travers criticized the film's excessive commercialism uh, and <laughs> felt that, quote, the script misses the pain Tim Burton caught in a man tormented by the long ago murder of his parents, end quote. But praised Kilmer's performance as having a, quote, deftly understated comic edge. Um, again, I feel like if, if we, they were able to have those those extra scenes, it would have added more to like that tormented. They always take out the good stuff. Why do they always take out the good stuff? Um, on the television program, Siskel and Ebert, Gene Siskel of the Chicago Tribune and Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times both gave the film mixed reviews, but with the former giving it a thumbs up and the latter a thumbs down. In his written review, Ebert wrote, quote, Is the movie better entertainment? Well, it's great bubblegum for the eyes. Younger children will be able to process it more easily. Some kids were led bawling for Batman Returns, where the PG-13 rating was a joke. <laughs> like it should have been R or something. Like, yeah. Um, uh, Mick LaSalle of the San Francisco Chronicle had a mixed reaction, concluding, quote, A shot of Kilmer's rubber buns at one point <laughs> is guaranteed to bring squeals from the audience. <laughs> You're not wrong. Rubber buns. Uh, some observers thought Schumacher, a gay man, added possible homoerotic innuendo in the storyline. Regarding the costume design, Schumacher stated, uh, oh, this is about like the, the it being like Greek statues. Because um, he felt like those were like the perfect bodies. Um, he, he had no idea that doing this and the earring and everything, um, they, these were going to spark international headlines. Um they they uh the earring the earring is just not, a silly not so much the earring but more so the the nipples the bulges no, the I butt. Know. Well, okay but the earring thing is just a silly thing that people yeah. used to say back N in the not, day not like. so much the earring I think I misread it. more like the Robin no suit. but people would say if you have the one earring on a certain side that you were gay well back then it wasn't safe to say it so you need to have signals I guess so but I don't know if that's true though um not entirely Chris O'Donnell felt quote it wasn't so much the nipples that bothered me it was the <laughs> cod piece. The press obviously played up and made it a big deal, especially with Joel directing. I didn't think twice about the controversy, but going back and looking and seeing some of the pictures, it was very unusual. Yeah. I mean, there's nothing wrong with the... I mean, you can't help it if you have a big dong, you know? But it's just the fact that it's there is just... It's yeah. just noticeable, you yeah. know? Um... <laughs> Uh, in terms of more modern reaction on Letterbox, it has a 2.5 out of 5. Uh, it's like a 5 out of 10. Mm -hmm. um, so, so again, kind of mixed, right? Um, here's some reviews from Letterbox. Logan Kenny has a very positive review. It says, I can't believe that there are people in this world who don't think this is the absolute shit. <laughs> That this is the I'm not that oh, it's not oh. absolute shit like the like it's really good. Yes, yes, yes. Or like has at least has something interesting going. I got you. Going. I got you. Um, Adam Bolt writes, "Quote: Holy shit! Everyone in Gotham needs to get laid." That's so true. And similarly, Robbie, 
says, quote, Nicole Kidman's character is the horniest motherfucker I've ever seen. True. It is very true. It's a very horny movie. And she is not afraid to say so. Um, so in terms of the legacy of this film, in terms of the Schumacher cut, so Jules Schumacher died in June of 2020. Oh, no. Um, um, after he died, media outlets was started reporting. Old? He was um, old, right? I don't know. Was Let's see. Sick? Joel oh. Schumacher. He. He. Uh, he was old. He died. He was 80 years old when he died. Oh, really? Oh. Yeah. Um, after he died, media outlets started reporting the possible existence of an extended cut, with the first rumors being thrown in by American journalist Mark Bernardin. Bernardin? Bernardin claimed it, it to be darker and contain less camp than the theatrical cut. Some of the differences include uh, Bruce having a vision of a human-sized bat, less of an emphasis <laughs> on Dick Grayson, and a focus on Bruce's psychological issues with Chase. We talked about this before. The cut used about 50 minutes of additional footage. Warner Brothers confirmed that alternative test screening cuts existed after an interview. So, like, because hmm. they would do test screens. So, there are... Yeah. So Warner Brothers even confirmed this. Yeah. Um, although they have no plans to release it and are unsure about what, if any, footage remains. Um, Batman Forever screenwriter Akiva Goldsman revealed in a YouTube interview in April of 2021 that he had seen the original cut of the movie dubbed Preview Cut colon one. Recently, uh, <laughs> that he had watched it recently as of April 2021 and they expect a rebirth for the movie coming up suggesting all the footage needed to make the Schumacher cut still exists and that the release of the director's cut might be possible. Oh. I would actually be really interested in seeing that. Um, again. Yeah, I think that could be good. Um, so Viviana, how you doing? With what? What? I'm just doing a check-in. How are you doing? Oh, I'm fine. Oh, <laughs> how are you? <laughs> I'm good. So, favorite part? <laughs> Seeing character, actor, line, what? anything. <laughs> um, Including, but not limited to. It doesn't have to be a scene, character, actor, or line. It could be so anything else. I know, I know. <gasps> oh. It's my show, too. The um, Probably... Probably Jim, Val, and Alfred. You're a rule breaker, aren't you? Yes. You like to break. We've rules. established this. Um, I think for me, my favorite part is the direction. Is Jules is Joel Schumacher's direction? Mm -hmm. um, I think even if you don't like this movie, I don't think you can say it's bad direction, mm -hmm. or at the very least, like it's it's lazy direction. I think it's like mm -hmm. very strong choices. Joel Schumacher is really putting a lot of effort in and really doing some really really like outrageously interesting. <laughs> camera work, push-ins, I did like the editing and stuff too. And you know what I talked about? The action was much better, I thought. Yeah. Like it yeah. felt closer to like what we would later get with the Christopher Nolan movies in terms of like I'm trying to a see. little more dynamic. Because again, the Tim Burton ones like felt very static uh -huh. and very stale. Like mm -hmm. and slow. Like the way he would frame them, the editing was a little slower and also especially that first one, Michael King could barely move. Yeah. So he would just go like, whoo! <laughs> <laughs> and like you know, just like I swing his arm a little, and then the the robber would fly backwards or something, yeah. right? Oh, I'm trying um, to think. Um, I remember when he was getting ganged up on by the neon people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I just find it a little more dynamic. I don't know if yeah. better is the right word, but just more dynamic. Yeah. Um. Okay, Viviana. One to ten. What do you give this movie? I'm gonna say a six. A six. Okay. Yeah. So you think it was just okay. Yeah, I thought I I really I really enjoyed it. I think that it was like So you like the other ones more, the other two more. Cuz mm -hmm. you give those sevens. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. here you go. I don't know. Here's the thing. Um, so again, I guess so because like this one was like fun to watch like color-wise and like just like visually and everything, but like I I did who was it? The someone you said. Um, not that it was like boring, but it just like I don't know. It just kind of like you were getting a little sleepy during it. I mean, it was late, but also I was just like, hmm, I don't know. Uh, where did it go? Where did it go? Yeah, the yes, I know the, the critical consensus. Yeah, what did that guy say? He said he he was talking about being boring sometimes. Yeah, but I wouldn't say boring. I would just say more like. Like, mm -hmm. it kind of washed over me. Mm -hmm. um, like, story-wise, I think maybe it didn't really go as deep 
as I yeah as I needed it to be. It, as, That's the thing. As I, could, I would need it to be in order to be like super involved. I, I would have liked a little bit more to sink my teeth into for sure. Yeah, um, oh. like even when like even with Robin, like they're like barely in any scenes together. Like like there's no That's a good point. like yeah. development of that relationship where that could like really that could really be something you know because like yeah they're both like angry sad people right yeah. <laughs> so like you know yeah, go, yeah, yeah. going at it you know um but yeah okay so you're giving it a six yeah and so, okay so you um oh wait no you know what so so but this would go above the serial films from the 40s correct okay because you know i'm asking uh what would you rather watch this or like the ones from the 40s Oh, this one. Okay, so that goes up because you gave those sixes as well. Okay. Yeah. I'm gonna give this movie a seven, mm-hmm. and I feel so like sometimes I'm like, I for I, I I worry. Do I really have? Am I really independent thinker? <laughs> do I? Am I? That's am what I I've persuaded? Been saying. That's what I've been telling you. No, but you think you think I'm just led by reviews. Like oh, if, if people no, say it's but a good heavily movie. influenced. No, but not in my opinion. In my I have very limited limited time on this earth. So if a lot of people say, no, if, no, I'm defending myself here. If a lot of people say this movie is a piece of shit, <laughs> I could very well love it. But like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to necessarily be like, that's going to be the next movie I'm going to watch. Yeah, yeah. Just statistically speaking, it right? It makes sense. It makes sense. But once I watch something, I usually form my own opinion. Because mm-hmm. there's plenty of movies that are considered like the best movies ever made that I think are like, okay, at best. Yeah. Like, on Letterboxd, I have, like, the pro subscription. So one of the features is, like, you can see, like, there'll be, like, the movies where you're, like, are very different. Like, you rated it very differently mm-hmm. than the average. Yeah. I like to go on there and be, like, there's a lot of, like, movies that are, like, 4.4s out of 5. Yeah. That I gave, like, a 3 out of 5 to. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, okay. you know, so so I'm an independent thinker, right? And But sometimes I doubt it. I'm like, it, it, do I just like this movie because everyone said it's really good? I think maybe that maybe makes me like a movie a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Because of like people saying it's good, right? The hype, yeah. But but I think this is a great example. I'm giving this movie a seven, and frankly, part of me wants to give it an eight. What? Because I like not again. This is not objective. These are subjective ratings. No, of course, of course. But I really dug it. There's a lot of flaws, which is why I'm giving it a seven. Give it an eight. But no, no, because I don't think it's. I don't think I would say it's one of my favorite movies ever. Uh. But I think it's really strong. Uh, and I think it deserves more credit than it gets. Mm-hmm. And if there was this longer version that maybe had a little bit more to sink your teeth into, mm-hmm. it wouldn't necessarily fix the flaws, but mm-hmm. it would give me more. It would it would add more good to it that maybe my I would like it even more, right? Mm-hmm. And I, I've been saying that it's like the Adam West one, but just like with a bigger budget. Yeah. And I think because of that, they're able to get even more stylized. Yeah. So I've only given one of these films a seven. Which was the Adam West one. Mm-hmm. I think I'm gonna put this above. What? So this is my second fate of the uh, ones we've watched. Yeah. And now I know for a fact there's gonna be others that I like more than any no, that see, we watched. Yeah. But see, I, I think that you're you're hitting on something. Is is that? Um, I think in '95 I would have rated it higher. Right, but I think now with like mm. having seen other ones like. It's kind of like tainted by the modern view, and like it yeah. just seems like modern silly. sensibilities. Yeah, like it just seems silly now. Now yeah. that we know that, like you, mm-hmm. you can kind of take it into a more serious kind of like yeah. thing. Um, I think I'm the exact not that opposite. I don't love the sil- I love the silliness, yeah. but like I guess like a darker silliness yeah. would would appeal more. I think I think I'm the exact opposite in that. If I seen you were saying like oh if you watch like back in the nineties you would have liked this more mm-hmm. I think I would have liked it less again for the reasons mm-hmm. I said at the beginning of this episode where it's like this is like the Batman movie this is what we're getting yeah uh like this is like the first live action Batman movie in three years oh well this it, you know what I mean and like I would be happy with this <laughs> whereas and it's like this isn't anything like how I would want a Batman movie blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. but because like my ideal Batman movies exist mm-hmm. I could just appreciate this for what it is yeah. So, um, so I'm giving it a seven. Um, I think that's it. What? For this. Oh, excuse me. Cut that out. Sorry. I, maybe, I don't know. We'll see. You need to cut that out.
That's it for this week's episode of Now That's What I Call a Franchise. Next week, we'll be watching the next film in the franchise, the 1997 film Batman and Robin. Viviana, where can they find us? You guys can find us wherever you get your podcasts, and don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Franchise Podcast. We know you have many podcasting options, and we thank you for choosing us. Peace out, guys. Bye.